Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the podcast, Master Round on the Podcast. I am your host, Boo Ada. There are no sponsors for this episode, so we're just going to jump right into it. And uh, before I do, uh, we're going to be living in weird times. Uh, this coronavirus is taking a hold on the entire world and everything that we do and how we live our lives. And so I believe that the best way to go about all this is to remain calm, remain patient, but remain aware, be vigilant on the changes of society and how that's going to affect you and how you progress and how we move forward as a society here in the world and but most especially here on guam if you're living in guam things are a lot different than they used to be and it just feels like i heard on the radio today that it's like condition one and it's true people are buying out stores uh, people are gassing up uh, getting water just the things that you wouldn't expect us to do we honestly don't know how to react to all this so You'll see people doing things a little bit out of the ordinary. And another thing that keeps coming up is we're going to have to be going according to the new norm. What that is, I don't know. I think it'll it'll be more of a precautionary tell. But once things settle down and the dust settles and we sort of see how this coronavirus um, unfolds over the next few months, we'll be able to determine how we're going to move forward. So I don't know if this is going to be the last episode for a while. I don't want to potentially contaminate anybody or anybody potentially, potentially contaminating myself or Matt as they come into the studio. Uh, we just don't know. So here it is. Here's the podcast episode. My next guest is Dr. Fred Schumann. He is a professor at the university of Guam. He is an expert in, in tourism and international business has a deep knowledge about a lot of these things and a lot of experience in both in both areas and we get to talk about guam's economic status we talk about the effects of the coronavirus and things that guam needs to do to move forward uh to not be so dependent upon one industry but become dependent upon multiple industries so here we go i believe that there there is there is much to do there is a lot of work to do in order to achieve a certain status it's not going to be it may not be in my lifetime but it it could be sooner it could be later we just have to keep, continue to work and work together so, without further ado, on the podcast, Dr. Fred Schumann, check it out. We're ready. Yeah, we're, nope. yeah. Dr. Schumann. Welcome to the show, Dr. Schumann. Welcome back. It's, yeah. uh, it's been, we had just mentioned it's been four years and uh, I just reached five years of doing this podcast and um, it's great to have you back on the show. There's been quite, uh, there's been a lot of events happening uh, as of late, but I, I just kind of want to backtrack um, uh, just, I guess, the last four years that we haven't, I guess, seen each other. And I knew when, when I crossed paths with you three times, uh, I knew it was time to get you back on the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm I'm glad you invited me. Thank you very much for having me for back. Sure. It's good to be good to be here. Um, so what's happened uh, in the last four years? Is so much so much has happened, um, and, and, and right. I think the focus in the past we we talked a lot about. I know we talked about my background and all. And now that we right. got that out of the way, right. And, uh, I, I think we also got into the topic of tourism, right, right, and that one one Guam initiative that was right, the one on, village, right. one village, one village, one product, and that whole idea was to get more uh, entrepreneurs 
to get involved in the industry because everybody here thinks that tourism equals mega millions or, or, or big <laughs> resorts right and that you have to go work for somebody to participate in the industry but you know we uh, you know, we, it's better for our economy if we have local uh, businesses and local business people that uh, sell stuff or provide services and that that money uh, gets paid uh, spent here and it circulates in our economy instead of a portion going off island right and do you, I, I do remember wow that's a huge <laughs> to filled up filled up the double the double slammer i'm gonna be extra talky uh-huh. <laughs> not extra talky talky but <laughs> extra words coming out of my mouth i'm gonna drink this extremely slow yeah yeah is it does the um, there's something you mentioned back in the day was that there's a there's a leak that needs to right. be plugged Yes. Um, and is that is that somehow kind of uh, really um, relieved itself or uh, yeah. the pressure or the, the leak sort of plugged a little bit in small in a small way over the last right. few years? Yeah. And that was uh, I believe that was a buy local campaign. And that was to get people to, uh, you know, by the way, there's nothing wrong with having businesses come in and, and invest in Guam. That's fine. Uh, but what i'm trying to get at is it, it, you know we need to we need to have people recognize that you can also start a business and you can also also make some money in right. the tourism industry it's almost like an open open playing field right 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 and so um so you yeah, have the money that's spent here uh, and and if you spend money with a local company they pay money to the government of guam they pay gross receipts tax they may have a corp they have a corporate office here there's no corporate office in chicago or Tokyo or Seoul. So, you know, money doesn't have to go to the corporate office elsewhere. So not only is the visitor spending, but then the businesses here are also spending buying suppl- uh, stuff from suppliers. If you have a, for example, a local Chamorro restaurant, you gotta buy napkins, you gotta buy soy sauce, right? You gotta buy all kinds of chemicals, you gotta buy all kinds of supplies. Right. And so that money gets spent here. So. There's the visitor spending, then there's the business spending, and then because the employees got enough hours from the visitors spending, now they're going to go spend their money. They're going to buy that, you know, two hundred fifty dollar pair of Nikes at Foot Locker, or they're going to go get a haircut locally, right? And they're going to spend the who money. They're being served by people who who are locally working. Right, right. right. So that money circulates, and we, of course, you know that's known as the multiplier effect. It's not just the money that's spent here. That money gets multiplied uh, from all the spending that, that gets done here. Right. Um, can, can I just mention one course, more thing? Of course, yeah. You know, I often hear people say, oh, you know, there's no reason to get into the industry because it doesn't pay much. The tourism industry? Yes, or just yeah, the, uh, yeah. And, and I like to give the example. Many people may not have heard this, but I like talking about this because... Oh. I personally met the man. There's a guy named Chuck Feeney. Okay. He went to Cornell, studied hospitality management. He's the guy that started DFS, Duty Free Shoppers. Uh, and uh, at one time, he was worth $1.9 billion. You know, that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And he studied hospitality management, and uh, he, uh, he started a small business initially, which became Duty Free Shoppers. By the way, he also started PIC. He owned Pacific Islands Club. So this man, he uh, he started out selling sandwiches uh, at, while he was going to school at Cornell. Uh, and then he um, joined the Air Force. And while he was in the Air Force in Europe, he started selling cars to people that were going back home to the, to the U.S. That, you know, that was the first... Uh, of his duty-free ventures, okay. is he actually accepted cash up front. He didn't have to buy a car yet. Yeah. So he says, you know, well, I'll, I'll have the car delivered to your home in Boston. Or how, do you gar- how do you guarantee something like that back then? Well, you know... I mean, your, he, your words are honor still, right? Yeah. So so he yeah he was, he was got the money up front, and he did that with cars, and then he started doing that with liquor. Mm. You know, I'm going get, to get you liquor for a really good price. I have it right. delivered. And so that eventually evolved into uh, the airport stores and then, you know, DFS as we know it, duty-free shoppers. Eventually, his partner, he had another partner. They both had about 
45, 46% of the business, they had minority shareholders. But these two guys built that business. And uh, he eventually, uh, he, he, gave his, he gave his money away. What, what did that mean back then when he was doing, when he started doing that? Or does that does that sort of make sense what I'm asking what, uh oh. for f- I guess as a businessman uh-huh. was it what is what does that sort of mean ah, gosh let me get this right as a businessman what does that sort of mean when you're going into something as new as duty free shopping well you know it it was a big risk but this guy Feeney he's a very very sharp man he okay. he was he had this uncanny way of uh, being able to see down the road, you know, not just the present, but just what's going to happen. Okay. And I guess he saw that uh, the Japanese traveler was going to be going to places overseas, and they, they, they're going to want to buy liquor, tobacco, and perfume, and uh, and that and he delivered. Right. You know, he was able to to uh, do that. And by the way, PIC is another really uh, good example of this. He was able to see. I think he was able to see that um, people are not just going to be interested in buying things like the liquor, tobacco, and perfume, that they're going to want to spend money on experiences. And so he created this concept of having very nice people have fun with you in a water park setting, and he was able to to capitalize on that. Keep people within your right. hotel. Yeah. Like give them a reason not to want to leave. Right. right. And And so... <clears throat> So I, I know you're, you asked that question. Well, what did it mean? Well, you know, I think he was born. He 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 was brought up um, from a young age. He he was kind of an entrepreneur. Okay. Yeah. He he would hire somebody to. He would go to the houses in the neighborhood to shovel snow. I think he grew up in. What time frame was this? This is in the. I guess this was in the six fifties, sixties. Okay. Okay. And he'd hire a, a, some big guy uh, to do the shoveling and then he'd go out and do the marketing <laughs> smart guy and so you know he he, he grew up um, doing that kind of thing and so he continued doing that but you know I don't think he was in it for, for the money because he gave his money away he just kept 5 million you know 1.9 billion is what he was worth he gave he just kept 5 million and he gave the rest to um, a trust and he asked them to give the money away, and, and the money was given to AIDS research, building hospitals in places like Vietnam. And philanthropic purposes. Yeah, yeah. and he wanted to have it all given, and it just like a, maybe about a year ago, he finally had given it all away. And by the time he had given all the money away, it had grown to like 35 or $40 billion because the money had been invested right. over the years. So, you know, many people here on this island don't know the Chuck Feeney story. And I met him. I definitely f- didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, I met him a few times. He he would come to PIC and you know and 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 talk to a number of us. You know, he was really a down to earth person. And uh, from my experience working for Duty Free Shoppers, I worked with them and PIC. I saw how this man, because his his company was a private company, right? He could do whatever he wanted to do with his money, and I saw how he had helped many people on this island with scholarships, medical help, et cetera, little, kinda, little league. It kind of goes against the, the general perception of what the, what the hotel industry and the tourism industry is doing to, well, what people believe it's right. doing to yeah. the island, right? Yeah, so, so whenever people say, oh, you know, you, you really can't, you're not going to make much money, you know, that's really not, not true, uh, especially if you're an entrepreneur, your earnings are limitless, right? Right. I mean, it, it really um, depends on how creative you are and, and how much work you're willing to yeah, put yeah, into it. Yep, yeah, all that. So, uh, yeah, that's something. That's probably something I didn't get to talk about the last time. But yeah. many, I think, many people on this island have been affected in some way by his work and by his um, business activities. In fact, if you drive by, you, you know where uh, Greyhound mm-hmm. is. That duty free. That used to be a duty free right next to it. Right, the IP and E building. Right. By the way, the the one before that. You know where that original duty free was? No. Okay, this is really interesting. Um, you know that uh, Camp Watkins Road. Camp Watkins Road. 
the old Pizza Hut in Tamuni. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. If you go up that road on the right where uh, Sakura Noodle House. Yeah. Sakura? Yeah. Sakura was the restaurant where the tour agents would be smoking and eating their noodles. Oh, while... in that area that's abandoned right, right now? Right. And, and the bus, buses would stop in the parking lot. And there used to be a store connected to um, that Sakura restaurant. Okay. That was the original duty free. Yeah, I've always wondered. Yeah. You know, you always drive by there and as you're, you know, you go out the back way out of Sakura to, right. to get out of the, to avoid that island there. And you always like, yeah. where has this been, right? Yeah. Why is this still here? <laughs> yeah. So that used to be the downtown store. Okay. And the way duty free worked is there's a downtown store and then there's the, the hotel shops. Every hotel had a duty free store in the lobby, except for the Hilton. There's reason behind that, you know, okay. had to do with, I don't know, uh, relationships, I guess. But every hotel had a duty-free store and the airport had, had a duty-free. So what we, we call this 100% PAX penetration. In other words, every tourist that came to Guam definitely shopped at duty-free because you either shopped in the hotel shop or when you go on the bus tour around the island, the first stop was duty free shoppers to the same store <laughs> duty free the main store yeah and then and then there's the airport right so there's like 100 percent pax penetration and uh you know it was very 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 successful did he didn't only do this here right no he did this um i, I believe the first one was in hong kong and then honolulu and guam was you know a a, a good duty free location right. for, for the business but eventually San Francisco, uh, New York, uh, I helped open one in New Zealand. Was it, was it a focus only on Japanese travelers? At that time, yes. And, and by the way, if you take a look at the duty-free logo, mm -hmm. it's a red meatball, kind of like the Japanese flag. Matt, let's see the DFS. Yeah. Let's see the DFS so, logo. So that's what it was. It was a red ball mm -hmm. and it used to say duty free in 45 degree angle it, it was a slant okay it changed eventually to dfs kind of like kentucky fried chicken changed to kfc right because not everybody you know you know fried chicken's not the healthy right right so they wanted to be able to sell other things <clears throat> so um yeah so that's that's the new, that's DF the new, one, right? new dfs and then the older one was a slanted one but then even before that if you just type duty free shoppers maybe you'll see uh uh yeah duty free shoppers you'll see the um the original if you type logo um you'll see that so that's that's kind of the history of um uh, maybe it's it, yeah it's not oh, yeah. showing but if you go to the duty free site Duty free shopper site, you'll see it. Okay. And so that that was all in the early days. Um, and when I was going back to that uh, Greyhound next to next to the Greyhound, mm -hmm. you see a bus shelter there. Right. Y you know that concrete bus shelter. Right, 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 right outside the parking lot. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is the type of thing that DFS and Chuck Feeney, the Chuck Feeney influence. Whenever the company gave money, they wanted it to be helping uh, and the cross-section of the community, not just to elites, for example. And so back uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s, we used to have those wooden bus shelters. Okay. And I don't know if you remember, you weren't around. No, I was, you I was born in 87. Okay, so, yeah. so it, if you go to the history part, by the way, Matt, uh, if you go, there's a history section, you'll see that. Um, so the bus shelters, the typhoons would blow them away, or there'd be a d drunk driver that would just ram into the into the wooden bus shelter. So, do, so the idea was, okay, let's build concrete bus shelters, uh, help help the students as they're waiting for the school bus, right? So that was one of the projects that uh, that uh, duty free did. And, and when I was working there, every employee got uh, uh, if they had kids. You got four years scholarship for their kids. It didn't matter if you're a manager or an, or an hourly employee. Wow. You got four years of college tuition for your kids up to, and remember, this is back in the 80s. So $2,500 a year times four is $10,000. Right. That was a pretty good sum. Right, right. So those are the kinds of things that uh, Feeney did. Now, he was able to do this because it was a private company. He could do whatever he wanted to do with his 
money that he made, right? Him and his partner. For sure. But he had given all his money away to a trust, and he kept it a secret. He didn't want anybody to know because he wanted to do it privately, just give the money away. Right. But Louis Vuitton approached him and said, we want to buy your shares. And that's when it came out that he had already given his money away. It's not really his anymore. It's not really his. Yeah. Right. So now LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moet, Hennessy owns DFS. Huh. It's, so now it's a publicly traded company. And what did he get out of it in the end? Not, that, not, that $5 million that's that he it. put to that's the side it. for himself? Yeah, that's it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's a, I mean, I mean, it is a good start, but it's, I mean, I, I guess the money never really mattered to him then. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a. Oh, there, there you go. Matt, there's that duty free logo. Down, down, down. Go down. ahead. There, there yeah, it is. Yeah. So that was, that was the original. Um... <clears throat> and it was more to appease to the, to the Japanese market. Yeah, you know, I, Feeney didn't tell me this. I never read that, but I mean, it looks like if you take a look at it, it looks like you take the duty free out of it. It looks like a, a flag. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it is and it's has this like piqued your interest into <clears throat> into wanting to study Japanese behavior because they're because because they're a big a part of our what makes up tourism on Guam and possibly any other Asian uh, cultures, uh, Korean, Chinese. Yeah. Right. And because everyone's kind of different, right? Good question. Yeah. You know, I was a history major. I, I was a I majored in history. I went to school in Colorado. Uh huh. And um, whenever I took a class in world history, there'd be a really thick world history textbook, and there would be one chapter on Asian and African history. A very short one, mm -hmm. as if not much happened, you know, in these other places. So uh, there's a lot, I guess the point I'm trying to make is now I think the world's changed and there are more scholars that have written in English about different, uh, you know, other places, mm -hmm. and people don't just have um, a view of, um, you know, that everything originated in, <laughs> West, <laughs> you know, Western in civilization, West. right? Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I had an interest in, in what was happening here in Guam, mm -hmm. and you know, there really wasn't much research done on um, the uh, behavior of tourists from this part of the world. So, uh, yes, I did take an interest in it. Right. Yeah. I mean, if any, right? I mean, what what would make you think about the psychology of the way people are, the way people act? And I guess I guess this kind of segues into into the book you released a couple years ago, a few years right. ago, yeah. right? Yeah. Where you were studying the changing trends of, uh, of Japan's right. uh, employment and uh, leisure activities, right? right. Is that, is that You're right? Yeah, you got yeah. it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't actually read the book, That's but okay. I mean, just from just from looking at the title, you kind of get a sense of what you were aiming for, yeah. right? Is is what are what are people there? What are they doing there that maybe they're seeking when they go somewhere else? Maybe something different, right? Maybe yeah, opposite. Yeah, uh, think about it. not all tourists are the same. They all don't think the same. And can I just give you an example? Let's get back to the earlier um you know the the origin sure. of this but yeah, we can always go back but pi let me just use pic as an example pic was the first to have a wedding chapel you know that little yeah chapel as you w walk down to the water park mm -hmm. now it's like a kitty place yeah that was the first ever wedding chapel on this island now every major hotel has at least one wedding chapel pic had the first water park pic actually was the first to go after korean visitors everybody else they were afraid to go after to mix the markets. Right. Now everybody wants to mix the markets, right? Um, but you know, one of the things that, uh, that I realized when I was at PIC is that when you do customer surveys, and if you only do it in certain languages, or if, you're, if you think, let's say, let's say we just did all the surveys in English, although it was done in English and Japanese. If you did surveys in just one language, and you didn't you didn't look at it by market, you you may not really get to know what's really happening because what tastes good to a Japanese tourist might not taste good to a, a tourist from another country. For sure, yeah, it's not a true sample, right? Of the of yeah, go ahead, right? Yeah. Just because you have an award-winning Belgian chef 
doesn't mean his or her cooking is going to appeal to your Korean visitor. Some people like Jollibee um, spaghetti. Others do not, right? I mean, you know, we definitely know the Filipino market like Jollibee's mm -hmm. spaghetti, but it may not be appealing. It's so that, not appealing to me. Okay, so, that, <laughs> so that's, that's... Sorry, Jollibee. <laughs> that's one example of um, just using food, but um, what's, what's clean in one market may not be clean to another. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's rude in one or nice, kind in one market may not be in another. Totally agree. Right? Yeah. yeah. So um, perception of safety, what seems safe in one market may not seem safe in another. Like in some places, you'll never see a security guard with hands in the pocket smoking a cigarette, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to be alert or doesn't give the view. Right. While in others, that's expected. So, Right. So, I mean, the difference between if you're going to... Say you go to Manila and you see the you see the the street guards and you can either feel safe or feel unsafe mm -hmm. with them holding the shotguns and the right, and the right, M16s, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so you know it really is important to understand where your visitors are coming from, what their perceptions are like, and why are they that way? And so that that really got me interested in, for example, why do these tourists buy so many Louis Vuitton handbags? Why do they want to buy these luxury products? Why are they buying liquor, tobacco, and perfume? Resell. Well, you know, th those are the big three, by the way. LTP, liquor, tobacco, and perfume. I got a good story. after. Okay. You, yeah. So everybody, whether they drank, smoked, or used perfume, everybody that came here bought three bottles of liquor, 200 cigarettes, and two ounces of perfume because you could take it back tax-free. So that bottle of Johnny Walker Black that cost you, I don't know, back in those days, it cost you less than $20, could be $100 in Japan. So even if you didn't drink, you would buy it to give it as a gift because the value, you know, so much more back then. Mm -hmm. So everybody, uh, you know, purchased these items. And it's really interesting when you look at the psychology and, you know, you, you start to understand why people do certain things. Let me just give you one more example. Yeah, yeah. Go for why, it. why do we have so many um, vitamin worlds and GNCs, and why does ABC stores sell all those supplements? I'll tell you why. Because many of the markets, like in Japan, 28% of the population is over 65. 28% is over 65. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And just think, they're at home all day, and they're watching these commercials, infomercials, you know, buy this glucosamine, you know, good for your knees, mm -hmm. buy this supplement, that supplement. And it's expensive. It's like 9,800 yen for uh, whatever, three, three months supply. Very expensive. So they come to Guam and they find that glucosamine or whatever the supplement is, and it's super cheap. So just think about this. Somebody is paying for ads. And if you own a business here, somebody is paying for the ads and doing your marketing for you. And you get to sell all this stuff right. to these tourists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. So all I got to do is go pick up a bunch of vitamins and <laughs> open up a store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so really, the point is, is, is the more you understand about what's going on in the source markets, yeah. what's, you know, why do people do certain things, the more successful you're going to be. Yeah. It, was, it, it it's it piqued my curiosity. Uh, me and my me and my girlfriend were in the Korean or in South. The, the um gosh itchy on airport yeah. uh -huh. in uh in seoul mm -hmm. and um we saw hundreds of of chinese travelers mm -hmm. unpacking perfumes bags and tobacco yeah yeah and repacking it into their luggages uh -huh. to fit into their hand carries that they bought at the at, at one of the the duty-free stores mm -hmm. and and we were standing there and they're just unpacking hundreds of things for us. And, and airport attendants are helping them like collect all the trash and throw it away. And so we were trying to figure out like, what is the intent? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I've, I was also given information that a lot of uh, Chinese travelers, they would come to, they would come to Guam, go to, or any duty free place. Mm -hmm. And it's not the color of the bag. It's how many of these do I get? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because maybe we can double or triple our money. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna. I got another story okay, to go with sure, that. But, sure. but you know, but it's at the same time, 
what the Chinese buy, they're not necessarily the same brands or items that the Japanese will buy or the Koreans buy. So, so that's also important to, okay. to, to realize. Uh, the Chinese, uh, when they go to Japan, they like buying Shiseido, for example, cosmetics. So the, mm -hmm. the, the drug stores where they sell cosmetics and makeup and that type of thing, they're, they're just doing really well whenever Chinese uh, go, to, um, go to Japan. So uh, I'm sure the duty-free business also ha has had to make some adjustments in their, the brand assortment to meet the needs of the different markets. But speaking of um, reselling, I also worked in the footwear industry, athletic right. footwear industry. I was Asia Pacific. Matt, you remember Athlete's Foot? Athlete's Foot, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I know people laugh when they hear that. <laughs> you know, But it was fungus. the thing to go to. Yeah, so, <laughs> so the Athlete's Foot, 800 stores around the world. And by the way, you know, it's the first store to put shoes on the wall. Really? You know, you know how the shoes are on the wall? Mm-hmm. The guy that started the Athletes Foot in Pittsburgh, a guy named Bob Lando, was the first guy to do that. Uh, and then everybody else kind of copied. But anyway. Uh, Foot Locker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But there's a, yeah, yeah. yeah. We won't mention all the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, um, so the, out of 800 stores around the world, we used to have the best sales of all the stores. Why? And again, going back to understanding, right? So if you have a store here, the way the way retail works is you have to buy products from a, a vendor, right? Right. So if you have an athletic footwear, multi-branded footwear store, you have to buy shoes from Adidas, Nike, Reebok, New Balance, and all those other guys, right? So Nike, undeniably, even now, I think Nike still is number one in the market. They had about a 45% market share. Number two at the time I was in the industry was Adidas at like 12% market share. Hmm. So by far, Nike was the leader. So if you wanted to buy Nike shoes or Adidas shoes, you had to buy from, if you're in Japan, you buy from Nike Japan. If you're in Korea, you buy from Nike Korea. If you're in Thailand, you buy from Nike Thailand. You can't go to the corporate office and say, look, I have 800 stores. We want to buy from you. They say, no, we leave it up to our country managers. So if you have a store in those countries, you have to buy from that country, Nike Japan. So because Guam is Guam, we bought from Nike USA, U.S. territory, right? right, right. So the catalog for Nike Guam here in here is much wider. The selection is much wider than Nike Japan. So if you purchased stuff to put in your store that's not sold in Japan, it would fly off the shelves because people will say, wow, man, I can't get this back home. Right. You know, I could sell it for two to three times or four times more than what I paid for it. So right. people would buy a, a bunch of these products. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether they were collecting them for themselves or the, reselling them, you know, that's what they were doing. Yeah. Does that work the same way for us as travelers going to foreign countries? Because I feel like it works for me when I go to an Adidas store. I'm like, well, we don't have this. Yeah. There's no way they make this in, in the United States. So I'm definitely buying this. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Yeah. In fact, um, when I was working in the industry, Converse, because they were even made, they were made in Indonesia at that time. You know, the all-stars, mm -hmm. super cheap because yeah. they would adjust the prices to the market and they were made there. So, yeah, I think there are certain items when you go travel, you can find some good deals for certain things. Yeah. Depending on where you are. Right, right. But how about for like the duty free stuff? Does, would we find travelers from the US or particularly Guam trying to go and buy out a bunch of duty free stuff to come and bring it back here to resell? Does it make sense to do that? I really don't think so. In fact, you know, I, I think. What makes that, I'm sorry, before yeah. you go on, uh -huh. what is, why is that a difference? Is it the exchange rate or the money, uh, the exchange rate between the dollar and the yen? And... Yeah, yeah, it could be the exchange rate. It could be a pricing policy in certain countries. Okay. But I think for duty-free items in the past, people would buy stuff here when they, for example, I, I know you're talking about going from Guam to someplace, but let me just use an yeah, example. That's... If somebody is coming from Japan in the past, it was much cheaper to buy the product here because in Japan they had so many middlemen. You know what I mean? It had to pass through so many hands 
and there were taxes that by the time it was in the retail store, the price is so much higher. Yeah, okay. But I, but I think what's happened in, in Japan now is that you can get anything in Japan these days. You can get anything. Yeah. And the prices have come down because they kind of got a, got rid of many of the layers. Yeah, you're looking for that 12-foot phone charger. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, yeah. And you, <laughs> yeah, just about anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, was, I, I threw myself off at the 12-foot phone charger. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh um <clears throat> we were we were discussing the um uh oh traveling being able to tra travel to a foreign country right mm -hmm. and does it work the same and uh hmm i guess i guess when when you're studying the when you're studying how tourists how how tourists shop here on guam why why is it the source that's important Right, it's because uh, okay, go ahead. I because I, 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 I had a follow up question. Okay, okay. Uh, let me let me just give you another example. Okay. In, and I'll use Japan as an example because this this is a really good one. They used to have neighborhood liquor stores, and they were called sakayas. They would sell sake, so you would go to the neighborhood liquor store and buy sake, rice beer soy sauce and say can you deliver it to my house and they would say yes yeah yes sir and they deliver it to your house you know because it's, it's like the rice place right rice and rice wine so all these neighborhood liquor stores were around and for for imported liquor the liquor would be very expensive because the middleman and all that right right but over the years and by the way because of that we sold so much liquor here in fact all the duty-free stores that we had on Marine Drive because we had stores on Marine Drive. I know you're too young to remember yeah, this, but possibly. Uh, we had a lot of stores on Marine Drive. We had a lot of stores in Tumon, and, and in the display case, there would always be liquor. People were selling liquor. But, but because, because these neighborhood liquor stores started disappearing, lar and because large discount liquor stores opened up, there was no need to do this three bottles of liquor thing. Right. And so what's happened in the source really does affect what's going to sell and how you do business here. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, is that why there's a lot of luxury shopping here on Guam and they try to promote that in, in the tourism industry here? You know, I think luxury, uh, Japan is a very important, not only Japan, China also now. I, I believe people line up to, like in Paris, duty uh, not duty free, uh, Louis Vuitton, right, to purchase um, luxury goods, right? Because people aren't necessarily coming here to buy, you know, shell necklaces and stuff like yeah. that, right? Anything that's sort of particular to uh, Guam, you know, Guam culture right. or whatever it may be, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm really not an expert on Chinese tourists, you know, that you'll have to talk to um, people that specialize in that area. But I do know, uh, I was listening to a professor speak about this, about the, the Chinese market, you know, quality, everybody likes quality. And if you got the money, you know, people want to buy quality stuff. Um, but they also want to show it. Right. So, uh, you know, there was a marketing professor that that was talking about this, uh, uh, that a, the, the Chinese consumer will buy Haagen-Dazs ice cream, but may not eat it at home. will eat it in public to show I'm, I'm eating Haagen-Dazs ice cream. <laughs> you know, they'll wear the Rolex watch, but inside the house, they have a Chinese brand aircon, Chinese brand um, TV and that type of thing. So yeah, I think there's part of that. You know that there's, um, and, and that's not just the Chinese. Market. It's almost like like living in a rundown place, but your car is R right. fully yeah. fully set up, right? Right. Or if you have uh, pretty much uh, everybody wear, has to wear a suit, everybody has to dress a certain way, but you want to stand out. You may want to have a Christian Dior bag or something that helps you stand out. But the, the funny thing is since so many people buy it now that you, you don't stand out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now but, that now you got Instagram, you really don't stand right. out. But, but you know, you may identify with a certain brand. And that's what I think luxury brands try to do. They try to get you to be like a loyal brand customer. Right. But, you know, I think instead of price, I, I really do think a um, company like uh, uh, Le Sport Sac, uh, they came up with a, I think exclusivity is important. You know, they had that Guam bag. Mm -hmm. 
Right. You could only buy it here in Guam. Mm-hmm. That design, right? Right. You could only buy it here. And just like I was telling you about the Nike. Right. The catalog being so big. Right. You can right. Only buy it here. It's exclusive. You can only, you can, you, you, it's not sold in their home country. So I think price differential, yeah, is important. But, you know, exclusivity uh, may be another um, way to capture the market. And I'll give you another example. Dale Kim, I, I don't know if you know him. He, he originally was the, he was the Hagen Dazs guy here, okay. and we were talking about the business. And I said, hey, you know, why don't you come up with a Guam only ice cream flavor? You know, everybody knows Hagen Dazs, right? Yeah. So you know, I think this exclusive there's something to it. Right. Does that fall under the realm of hospitality management? Yeah. You know, I think every everybody in in, in some way wants to try something new. Right. Uh, I think I think there is an element of escape. Right, because brand loyalty goes sort of goes beyond region, right? Mm-hmm. It sort of it, it you would think it'll trickle down, but it sort of kind of trickles up. And if say the CEO messes up, then everything kind of just comes down with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, to create and in in today's volatile society, where anything you do can can sort of put you in hot water, yep. business wise, and yeah. all of a sudden. Either your stocks are going down or people aren't just buying your, your stuff no more, right? Look at uh, Papa John's uh-huh. created this loyalty. Uh, people were people were thinking the freshest pizza, the freshest ingredients. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is not a Papa John's commercial, but, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, yeah. It, and all of a sudden he, he runs into this, uh, into this problem or this uh-huh. issue. And now people, Papa John's are closing down, yeah. right? And yeah. Well, another good example is Victoria's Secret. Mm. You know, remember how popular uh, Victoria's Secret catalogs were? And right. you know, there's a show, Victoria's Secret show. They're practically, I mean, they're actually, they just sold their, their uh, a good portion of their company to an uh, investment firm. They're having a lot of problems. And part of it is because of the Me Too movement. And then also because people aren't shopping in their stores because of the online. Online. Uh, and so, you know, nobody would have predicted this, right? Right. Who, who, who would have thought, oh, Victoria's Secret's not going to be right. doing so well. Right. <clears throat> what is that, what does that sort of mean f- for, for Guam in terms of people trying to create a loyalty of, you can only buy, you mentioned that you, uh, you were mentioning to, you were talking to someone about creating something specific to Guam, but does that sort of go outside of more popular band brands? that are um what am i trying to say uh that are that are not from uh, that are from here say like okay. crowns right or any any of these popular popular local brands yeah did i talk about the mcdonaldization of society the last time i was here no but um my girlfriend took your class oh, okay last last year oh, okay. and um i uh and she we, she was trying to explain it to me, okay. and uh, we we got us we got a sense of what it was about. But yeah, if you want okay. to explain on the sure. on the podcast, I gotta say up front, I like McDonald's. <laughs> I go there, you know, I, I I eat McDonald's. Yeah, they've done a lot of things um, to change uh, how restaurants operate. In fact, there's a really good book called uh, McDonald's in East Asia or something like that. Yeah, McDonald's in a movie. There's and a the movie? movie. Yeah, there's oh, a movie that's super really size. Good. Uh, no, it's called. Um, oh my gosh, um, Matt, you want to find out what the McDonald's movie was called? It's on Ray Kroc, and that's when I figured. Oh, okay. That's that's, yeah. that's when I found out that he was like 63 years old yeah. when he when he found out about the McDonald's brothers, right? Yeah, franchise first franchise yeah. it and stuff. He and, was selling them milk milkshake right milkshake machine. machines. Yeah, he's like, how many do you need? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's the one, was it Michael Keaton? Yeah, it was yeah, Michael yeah, Keaton. Yeah. So anyway, so McDonald's, you know, they, they have the a... founder. Yeah. yeah. Ray Kroc, uh, he, he bought it from the founders, right? right? The, the, the brothers. Right, because they created this super efficient assembly line right. for making food. Right. And by the way, In-N-Out Burger started just about like 20 miles away, right around the same time. Really? And they're the ones that first came up with the drive the uh, drive through microphone, uh-huh. but they didn't patent it. So, you know, <laughs> that was the end of that. But still, you know, in and out is kind of like the opposite of McDonald's because 
they uh, everything's f fresh, right? All right. It's not as efficient, right? right? It's, so everything's fresh. They they even do the cut the potatoes in front of you and you know, that type of thing. Right. But anyway, let me go back to um, McDonaldization of society. So according to a, a guy named uh, George Ritzer, he said there he says there are four uh, aspects of McDonaldization. One is efficiency. They're very efficient, right? They're also calculable. You can calculate everything. Like you can calculate how long it takes. They, you push a button and the exact amount of Coke goes into the cup. You know, it's calculable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the other one? Uh, everything's controlled. Like, you know, you're supposed to throw your trash away. You're supposed to stand in line. You're not supposed to take too long to order. Right. Uh, what is it? Efficient. Uh, I'm sorry. Efficient, calculable, controlled, and predictable. Everything's predictable. The menu is pretty much predictable. Right. Wherever you go. Doesn't really change, yeah, yeah. throughout the world. Right. And, you know, it's cheap. It's going to taste the same. Hong Kong tastes the same as <clears throat> San Francisco or wherever, right? So what this author was saying is that everything in our lives have kind of become McDonaldized. Give you some examples. Uh, USA Today is efficient, controlled, calculable, predictable. You know that a certain color section is going to be sports, a certain color section is going to be entertainment. It's also efficient. CNN is also efficient. You don't have the really long, in-depth articles, but it's quick. Right. Right? Yeah, two minute reads. Right. And so uh, efficient, predictable, calculable, and controlled newspapers. Hollywood movies, efficient, right? right. Controlled, predictable. That's why you have Rambo 7 or what, whatever. <laughs> right, right, or right. Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious 15. 15, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's predictable, right? You know what's right. going to happen. Yeah. Uh, um, childbirth is also, you know, we used to have a very, uh, a fewer, a smaller percentage of uh, cesarean births, but now it's gone up because it's efficient, predictable, calculable, and most doctors now can go home and have dinner with their family. Right. And so, you know, their university education has become McDonaldized. You got, you buy a textbook, comes with PowerPoint, comes with uh, tests. The tests you fill in the bubbles but can you say can you say that 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 existed even before mcdonald's and it's mcdonald's that sort of popularized it yeah you can say that but i don't think there were as many it wasn't as systemized okay. as as mcdonald's okay i see right? what you're saying yeah i mean um, uh, there's probably some aspects of it oh because i was just thinking of maybe uh the ford assembly line or something like right? that yeah, or yeah. or the people who built the pyramids or <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> you know, that was, that was a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, maybe some of it was there, but not you know the total package, kind of like Mc, McDonald's, right? Right, right, right. And so, just about everything, even weddings, have become McDonaldized. Okay, next, you know, and uh, wedding. Yeah. So, you know, the author says, you know, it, it seems to be good, but it's not really good. He calls it rationality of irrationality it seems to be good but it's not if you have that mcdonaldized education it seems all good but then people may not know how to write an essay if all they're doing is filling in the blanks people may not be learning about more current things if they just stick with the book it's almost like you're on automating humans right yeah right yeah, yeah. so what I, uh, the point I'm, I'm making is is that many people today have been brought up in a mcdonaldized society they don't know what it was like before these systems were in place, right? Right. And so one village, one product, where each village comes up with their own product and it's handmade and not everything's going to be the, exactly the same. Right. Uh, and, you know, it's not going to be as efficient when you go to a family restaurant and you, you, you order a, a certain dish. You know, it may not be all those things that you find in McDonald's system, but some people want that. You know, they, they want to go to uh, uh, have that experience where not everything's predictable, not everything's controlled, you know, that type of thing. Right. It's almost like a, a seeing a, I'm trying to find a good analogy to well, it. It's, it's, a, it's like, like seeing a live performance, right? Yeah, and or, between listening to the CD and you go into a live performance and it sounds exactly like the CD, right. you're like, you know, you know, here, here's another watching a foreign film hmm. instead of a Hollywood film. 
you know, just because you spend two hundred million dollars on a film doesn't mean it's going to be good. Yeah, there there are many really good films. Like uh, I don't know if you've watched any Iranian films, Korean films. Oh, I love Korean films. Right? Yeah, and so you know that, that's another way to kind of step out of that. You know the the system that everybody's used to. So again, you know, I'm Quote, not quote norm. Yeah, film. yeah, yeah. So I'm not I'm not knocking. Have we fallen to that here? You know, I think so, because oftentimes when I talk to students about coming up with a business plan or when we have these projects where you're supposed to come up with a, a business, you know, you know, people tend to say, well, let's bring Krispy Kreme here or let's, let's do this or that. Um, when you really should be thinking about how can you be, how can you stand out, you know, how can, how can it be different? Or evolve something that's already existing. Yeah, maybe make it like, better. Maybe like Chamorro Village. Yeah. Right? How? Yeah. I mean, I can think of Chamorro Village and as long as I've been going there, and it's still possibly the same setup, mm -hmm. you know, maybe different vendors here and there, but ultimately it hasn't really changed. It kind of has that McDonaldization, right? Mm -hmm. Same barbecue area and the same way the barbecue's cooked. Yeah. It's the same taste, uh -huh. and the same marinade, mm -hmm. and it's just different people coming in to taste it. Right. Yeah. So people want to see something different when they go to a destination. In fact, if you look at all the statistics of the growing areas, actually Asia Pacific is one of the fastest growing areas for international tourism. People don't want to go and see someplace that's similar to what they're used to. And I kind of joke around with students. And if I put a blindfold on them, put them on a plane and then have them go into a town, a city someplace, and I take off the blindfold, it may take a while for them to figure out where they are because they're going to see a McDonald's, they're going to see a Hyatt, <laughs> Starbucks, right? Right, it, right. It, it's all pretty much the same. Yeah. And so people want to go to a place that's like totally different. And so Guam is a 4S destination, sun, sand, sea, and shopping. You can go to so many other 4S destinations. Yeah. Where it's cheaper, you know, you get that 30-minute massage on the beach. Right. For, you know, cheap. Right, Cabo. Right, yeah. <laughs> so what makes the island different? What makes the def de destination different is, is what's important. How do we take advantage of it, right? I mean, we're the biggest island on our side of the Pacific, pretty much. Yeah. But it seems like we have a hard time taking hold of what, of, of maybe the, the people who are coming here. I don't know why why does it seem like the the economy kind of bounces up and down and then uh, correct me if i'm wrong yeah stop me anywhere I'm okay kind of well you know tourism is you know here i am i'm, I'm a guy that that uh you know, talks about tourism and i worked in the industry but i've got to say you know tourism is a is a volatile industry you know things happen right. whenever a world event happens like SARS or Gulf War or whatever, right. even this this With the coronavirus, coronavirus um, people start stop traveling, and you know I was asking Matt about you know the the population. And there was a reason I asked about the population, uh, and Matt, it was what, what year was it? Eighteen oh eighteen oh four. You know the world population today is seven point eight billion, I believe seven point eight or seven point nine billion. When I was in the first grade, which was not that long ago, <laughs> the population was 3.5 billion. So if you think about it, if I go back to my first grade and I snap my fingers, over half of this population would be gone from this earth. You sound like Thanos right now. Or Thanos. <laughs> so, oh, 8 billion. Well, we're pretty close to 8 billion, right? Right. It's probably a um, 7.8. Oh, 2020. Yeah, 7.8. Yeah. So. So, you know, we've, and, and in 1804, we were only 1 billion. Yeah, you want to click that graph right there to the, to the left? Yeah. Yeah, so, what, what year oh, was Oh, that it? goes back to the 50s. Okay, well, and so, what, what yeah. Uh, try, try something that's more, uh, that goes back more. Uh, it doesn't have to be this uh, picture, maybe, um. Maybe in that ward population clock, uh, if you want to, uh, yeah, just go back, just go back. Oh, is it not letting you go back, back? There you go. Yeah, so, well, let, let me just, uh, while, while we're looking, 
just mention that um, the amount of time it takes to double the world's population is like is shrinking and so from the time I was in the first grade to now it's it's more than doubled and it's like 50 years or so right and and so you know if you think about it you know the reason why we're talking about sustainability and and all this stuff is because the earth is not the same as it was just right. 50 just, years ago just pull the mic to you yeah yeah so it's yeah. flexible you can okay just, uh... so yeah so you know there's the, the the population is growing the number of people traveling internationally is also growing mm -hmm. um over a billion people yeah and you're right from 150 years to 1950 that was 2.5 billion that we saw and then now it's from 1950 to 2020 yeah which is 70 years in half the time literally half right. the time right. yeah we doubled in population right quadrupled right tripled. And, and so yeah, quadrupled so you know now it's cheaper to travel internationally low-cost carriers um a lot of flights uh, a lot more people we're gonna have 1.8 billion people traveling in the next 10 within the next 10 years we're gonna see 1.8 billion people traveling around the world and so we really need to start um, working together, not just tourism, but, you know, public health, you know, governments, all really need to be working together to to prepare for, for this. You know, how, we got to start doing things now. And, and you're not just talking Guam. This is worldwide, right? Right. Okay, okay. And so when people talk to me about tourism, they often think that, oh, all I, all I talk about is hotel and restaurant stuff. And, you know, that's important. That, that is important because, you know, the jobs are there. Mm -hmm. Many people's lives depend on what's going on in the hotels and restaurants and mm -hmm. retail. All that's very important. But, um, you know, my focus really is helping um, economies develop properly so that you're not, for example, trashing the place. You're not so that the people are benefiting, the people that live there are benefiting. Uh, all that's very important. But the the population thing is is i wanted to bring that up is because we're starting to see over tourism and that's a kind of a new word that that we're hearing a lot in the tour in tourism academ academia uh, palau experienced it over yeah. tourism yeah and so you know what do you do what do you do to um prevent over tourism i was at a conference recently a tourism conference and the guy that started lonely planet was there oh, okay yeah guy named Tony Wheeler. Uh, you know, the Lon Lonely Planet. Yeah, I've been on the website yeah. and, um, before I go to travel to Asia. Yeah. It's a good, it's a, it's a real good reference to right. see what you want to do, where you're going to go. Yeah. Especially but, if you're like a nomadic traveler, right? Back that's right. Years, yeah. yeah. So he, he um, lets people know about places, to, recommended places to stay, right? On a budget. Yeah. On a budget. Yeah. yeah. So by the way, you know, that's another example. Remember, you can't make money in tourism. Tony Wheeler sold uh, Lonely Planet to BBC, and I believe he's worth over $100 million Wow. Now. And so he was at this conference, and he talked about over-tourism, and he also talked about under-tourism, that there are many places that you can go to where you don't have the over-tourism. And, and this is really, really interesting. You, you already know this, but he said, you know, everybody goes to that one cathedral. And he says, what I, he says, what I always do is I go just two streets down, and I have another cathedral all to myself. And so that's kind of been his philosophy, is just don't go to places where everybody goes. You know, go to the little bit out of the way place, a little bit over here, a few streets down, and you don't have to experience those those crowds. Right, as yeah. if you're not in a touristy place. Yeah. So, so what do you do in a place like uh, Palau or other over places where there's over tourism? And this is also another interesting topic. Um, what do you do? Some places they charge fees, like Palau now charges a green fee. If you visit the Rock Islands, they also charge another fee, I believe. Yeah, because if people don't know, uh, Palau, they had to close Jellyfish Lake right. for quite a while yeah. because of over-tourism, and basically they were killing all the jellyfish yeah. that, were, that were inside the inside those lakes, so they had to close it down to give it enough time to regenerate. And I don't know if it's still open or it's, if it, I mean, it's still closed or whatnot, but that's sort of the the whole thing behind 
why Palau had to take certain measures in order to save their their natural um, beauty or scenic right. sites, right? Right. And you know they they have that special jellyfish. They don't have stingers, right? Um, and I believe that that's from the fact that the island used to be the uh, jellyfish came from the ocean, but now it's enclosed. It used land- to be underwater, right? Right. Right. It's now yeah. it's landlocked, so they didn't need the stingers anymore. So you have people going in with the uh, suntan lotion and all kinds of stuff, and people in the in, too many in the water. Mm-hmm. So one way is to to charge these fees. And Bhutan does this. They have a fee per day. If you've got to show that you've made arrangements to spend, for example, $250 a day to to get a visa to go to that country. Uh, So that's one way. But then, you know, the the discussion that we had was, well, what about people that don't have money? Are you just allowing people that have money to go to places, to enjoy places on this earth? It's not fair. Mm -hmm. What about the students? that don't have uh, the, the the ability to pay these fees. So another suggestion was to have uh, people make reservations and show an intent and an interest to visit the place because sometimes you have people that are just in the area and they say, oh, let's go over there. And then you get these crowds going to a place that really are not that interested in the place. And then all of a sudden, you know, place gets trashed or the important historical tree it has a significance is no longer there because of over tourism. So these are all, you know, really uh, interesting discussion topics. And I, I'd like for people to understand that, you know, this these are the kinds of things that people that study tourism um, are, are really uh, involved in right now because this is a worldwide issue, this over tourism and all of these other issues like uh, coronavirus and uh you know, other world uh, events. Right. Yeah. Just think about the cruise industry, by the way. How long do you think it's going to take for that industry to recover? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, people see, I don't, I'm not getting stuck on a boat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people see that kind of like, they view it like maybe as, as a death trap, right? Yeah. You're trapped. For sure. Or even going to being, being in third world countries, uh-huh. right? And if, if, uh, if, if like a world, if a uh, say say like the coronavirus, right, and you're in a third world country, it's like no, I don't want to, I don't want to go there, and something like that hits, and then what am I going to do? There's no medical services for yeah. me. There's nowhere for me to retreat to because I'm not home. And what are they going to do? Lock me up in my hotel? I don't have any resources. Who's going to feed me? Mm-hmm. And sort of all these kind of like panic decisions start coming right. up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let me just give you another example of over tourism: climbing Mount Everest. And yeah. maybe Matt, if you can you can look this up. How much does it cost to climb Mount Everest? And this is a sad thing. It's no longer a matter of Are you your, down? your ability. <laughs> your ability yeah. to climb Mount Everest. Yeah, because if I'm not mistaken, it's become so trashed with people oh. with uh people taking shits up there. There's dead people. Right, dead people. There's dead people right, who walk over. Leaving their camps, right? Up to eighty five thousand. Uh, Preston price... climb over 115,000. Right. Here, here I can read it through. This is from the manual.com. The price range for a standard supported climb ranges from 28,000 to 85,000. A fully custom climb will run over 115,000. And those extreme risk takers can skimp by for, for well under 20,000. Typically, this includes transportation from Captain Dew or loss of food, base camp tents, Sherpa support, and supplemental oxygen. Right. And not, not only is there this cost, but you're also putting these Sherpas' lives, you know, in danger. Uh, and so you, you've got people that maybe CEO of a big company or a vice president you know, living in the States. They got lots of money, kind of bored with their routine. And they want to do something special, want to be able to tell their friends they climb Mount Everest. And so they spend all this money, but they're not really, they're not ready to, to climb. And, uh, and that's why we see what's happening there. So there's like a long line of people, even near the summit, there's like a long line. You may get a few seconds up there and then you got to come back down. Really? Yeah. So there's, there's just a lot of things happening in the world today. It's, it's, uh. Uh, is there are is is there there are they trying to get a sense of control over it 
uh, is it better to just manage it piece by piece or is because I'm, I'm sure there isn't just one solution right you can no. charge you can charge you can charge an arm and a leg but someone will figure out how to how to still get there and still uh still create sort of that over tourism right. uh, thought of just one place yeah well you know i'll give you another example world heritage sites so if a place becomes a world heritage site it becomes another attraction and uh, mount fuji just became a world heritage site a few years ago okay and that just increases the number of people that go to mount fuji and, and that will increase the number of businesses that will want to do business in the area increases trash and all that stuff so um, you know, in, in, in some ways it's good to get that designation, but it also can work against you in, cause you can't, you know, people are always going to want to make some money. Right. right? right. Um, uh, so there's gotta be, like you said, I think, a, a concentrated effort to try to control the development. Right. And so kind of just scaling it down here to Guam now, right? We want, we want more tourists to come through, but how do we manage exactly what you said? trash overuse of places people hiking to to these sites what are we going to start charging people to go to Pagan mm-hmm. or charging people to hike Sela Bay um but yeah it's it's just something that we're concerned about but since <clears throat> since we don't really get an over is there is okay I should start here is there an over tourism problem here on Guam and if there is, is there is there anything in particular to be concerned about, and are there ways to mitigate it? Okay, so to answer your first question, we've we've had uh, a record number of visitors in the past year. I think it's one point six million now. <clears throat> um, but you know, in a way, we've we've been able to control it by limiting the number of hotel rooms we have. Sure. <laughs> I think we have about 9,000 hotel rooms. Uh, so you can only have so many people um, come to the island. Uh, but at the same time, even if we hit those record numbers, uh, some people are questioning, well, how does it benefit me? Okay, we, we got a record, but why don't we have enough money for schools? Yeah, you're totally right. Because I looked, I looked at the the activity report, you know, the one that GVB puts out every year, and... And I felt the same way. It's like, well, if I, this this many people are coming in, yeah, how do I attach myself to that? Because I'm not seeing it, right. and maybe maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's a formula that wasn't given, right? Yeah, we don't have enough police. Um, you know, they're not, um, schools aren't getting their their budgeted allocation. Like the university, of course, is is an example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've seen services being cut, right? And so. You know, that's, that's the question. So going back to the, the, the topic of, it's not just quantity of number of people, it's how much spending there is and how much of that is circulated in our economy. That's really what's important. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I always tell people, if somebody says, oh, we hit, here's, a, here's an example. Oh, we have the highest, we're the best hotel on the island because we have the highest occupancy. We're at like 99%. But then you can ask, what's your average room rate? Oh, fifteen dollars. Well, of course, you're, you're going to have high occupancy. <laughs> right, right. Fifteen dollars. Yeah. You know, so there's a formula to figure out how well a hotel is doing. You multiply the average room rate, the average daily rate, times occupancy, and then you'll get a certain number. You can't just look at quantity. You got to look at, you know, other factors. Right. And if yeah. they're and if they're actually spending money here, because right. you can yeah. have someone occupying that space, but they do, they can just all they want to do is be solitary mm-hmm. and just stay inside all the time, yeah, and not spend a dime, right, right, yeah. So I mean, it, and then it kind of boils down to what you were saying earlier. It's like, um, for for local businesses, right? You want people to start creating these, it, the idea of people creating or starting their own businesses and creating their own products for people to buy and whether and to kind of get out of that mcdonaldization mm-hmm. of what they're used to seeing yeah um yeah but let me just say though okay. the past few years after the last time we talked you know, you know 
things are looking really good with our young people. I agree. For example, take a look at all the food trucks mm -hmm. that have opened and very success. You know, they seem to be very successful. You know, they're opening up all over. We, I think there was a, a new Guam tour company, a local company that's, that's doing tours. Okay. Uh, there, there are a number of businesses that have opened up. And so, you know, I really like seeing that, you know, people actually taking the step to, to, to get something started. Yeah. Something happened in 2015 in 2016 mm -hmm. as to, as to how all of a sudden, you know, even, even if it goes down to all the way down to the arts, people are putting out yeah. more things mm -hmm. of theirs that sort of represents not just Guam, but, uh, them. Yep. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and people are being able to make a living off of their art. People are able to make a living off of, and people aren't even, <clears throat> they're not even necessarily coming to Guam. Now we have the internet where you just post it up on the internet. Yeah. Like, can I buy that? And then we ship it off and boom. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's this, there's, I don't know if I mentioned this, this guy, he, he, I went to a farmer's uh, conference uh, a few years ago and there was a farmer from Maui. He came to Guam and, he has he has a farm and he has farm tours uh and he also sells uh stuff on the side of the road and he, he told me he's a he's an old retired uh surfer so he uses his old surfboards as uh signs to, you know to say that you know he's right up the road mm -hmm. he says i don't use a pickup truck because it rains a lot in maui so i have a van and i sell my stuff on the side of the road and he has an organic farm it's but it's not usda organic he says i call it ono organic <laughs> he says certified ono organic and he says i'm going to keep doing that until they tell me to stop and matt if you go to uh um ono ono organic farms you'll you'll see this guy so so up to this and that was like seven eight years ago he's still doing ono organic so he's using his creativity and you know he's using whatever resources he has because he knows how expensive it is and how difficult it is to get this usda right. organic so i asked him what do you make the most money on oh there you go oh no organic certified <laughs> so and he's got a tour it says best tour on maui i think so i asked him well what do you make the most money on he says oh uh <clears throat> maui coffee he says, I don't get to charge as much as Kona coffee, but, you know, I, I do well with it. And he says, I sell it on the internet. You know, so here's a, a, a farmer, a small business, and he's doing well. Does that change how money, of course, the money that's, mm, that doesn't really change how the, gosh, what am I trying to say? That doesn't really change the economics of the way money is spent here on guam though right with people selling their products off island yeah but they still have to they're supposed to pay uh tax right, right? right. Their, okay. their 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 corporate office is here okay yeah my my uh depth of economics is okay. uh econ 101 oh no <laughs> it's, good. It's, yeah, it's, it's a good question because yeah. when we first started the um the uh buy local mm -hmm. that was the first step the first step with that was to get people, look, I like buying stuff on Amazon and, you know, I like ordering stuff online. That's fun. Me too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. the whole concept of the buy local was let's all shift 10% of our spending, just spend 10% more <clears throat> locally, you know, support the local business, just 10% more. Right. And so if everybody did that, it would really help the, the uh, economy. And then the next step was let's, identify companies that have a corporate because the, the that definition the earlier definition was if you have a franchise or if you have a business uh it's still local because you know it, you have local employees and you know the person who's managing it is local mm. but we have a uh, another phase of that and that was local first and that's to have a directory where the corporate office is here so that way there's not that money you can you can see which companies are going to give the biggest, um, yeah, you know, the the percentage back to the local uh, community, right? Yeah. Um, one person comes to mind is Lenny Farron, mm -hmm. and uh, both the restaurants that all the restaurants that he's opened up, he it's all locally, everything's locally sourced, right? And so that's sort of his way 
to giving giving back and utilizing the community and farmers right and right. putting putting local farmers uh, vegetables that's you know, homegrown mm-hmm. into the food that people are able to eat right and and that he was the first one that came to mind when you so when you know when kind of said buy local support local right but that's within not that's just not being a consumer that's being a business person but sourcing sourcing all your products to keep it within the island and it's it's kind of like a great formula to keep mm-hmm. money flowing here yeah and then just speaking about farm products there's the food security issue we want to have more farmers because what if what if we we can't ship anything here mm-hmm. what if something happens that we can't get food just like when onions and bananas were yeah. shortage here right right, right. Ma- uh, something about matson when the protests in the in the states was going on right yeah and we weren't getting onions and yeah. bananas like uh yeah anybody got onions <laughs> so so you know because of the food security issue there's a lot of there are a lot of grants that the federal government will provide <clears throat> for yeah. bu- business people that want to start for example, making value-added farm products like mango jam or, you know, any, anything that has to do with agriculture. So there's that, and there's also the fact that uh, locally grown vegetables and fruits, they're, it's, they're more nutritious, right? Because right. they haven't been, you know, they're not, it, it hasn't been uh, so long from the time that they were cut from the Harvested, tree. Right. right, yeah. Yeah. Um we keep we keep tapping on the coronavirus thing, but I feel like it's a good time to bring it up because mm-hmm. um, we're we're starting not only us are starting to see economic impacts, but also and it may be a lesson for us to sort of see this um, by local support local and create this kind of inner economy for Guam and maybe eventually Micronesia if things can sort of go that way. But you know, with 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 that. With now the coronavirus going on, are we seeing like a lot of economic impacts uh, to Guam? And I mean, it's, uh, yeah, sure, tourism. But is there any areas that we cannot see that's maybe not being mentioned in the media? Oh well, you know, I think I think it's, it's affecting everyone, uh, whether you're in the tourism industry or not, because it's going to affect how much money the government's going to take in from tax. From taxes right it doesn't help that the minimum wage kind of went up yeah too with minimum, all this yeah, yeah all yeah. this happened yeah yeah and then um you know for hotels and restaurants the one variable cost is payroll you can't change the rent that you got to pay you know who the landlord you can't change that you may your hotel is on somebody's property you got to pay you still have to pay for utilities even if your rooms are empty you, know, you don't want mold and mildew growing in the rooms. You, you know, you still have these fixed costs. Right. And so that's another area. People are, their hours are, are cut, right? Right. And so that's going to affect their spending. Um, and all these businesses that are not directly in the uh, hotel and restaurant association or even retail, um, people that do indirect business like the chemical people, people that do cleaning, uh, people that provide the Kikoman soy sauce. Right. You know, I mean, uh, the whole, you know, all the indirect businesses are also going to be infected. Uh, affected. Uh, if you look at the GH, this is really interesting, look at the GHRA membership. Most, most people think GHRA is only hotels and restaurants. Most of the membership, uh, it's allied members it's businesses that want to do business or that are doing business with the hotel hotel and restaurant uh, industry. Right. And we have a lot of them. Uh, banks do business with the uh, tourism industry. Um, telecom does business. Oil, right? right? I mean, they, well, they all do business with the... So everyone has a vested interest yes. into how every everybody's, or how the hotel and restaurant industry is being affected. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you think Kmart would be here if we didn't have tourists? No. Right. Although they may not say that, you know, but, <laughs> but yeah, you know, 24 hours, they're all still open 24 hours, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I think, um, it's, it, and, and, and you, you know, this, the stock market 
is really uh, feeling the crunch mm -hmm. now uh, because people don't really know how, how long this is going to last. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, production of just about everything has gone down. Yeah, I think manufacturing in China has gone down like 45% right. in the last few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, uh, somebody sent to me today, they sent me 19, uh, it was a message, it had 19 pictures of all the specials <clears throat> going on. In the, you got that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all yeah. the specials <laughs> going on, like, at, and I'm, I'm not doing an ad for uh, Nico, but Magellan, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good deal. You, you can pay for one person, and the other person's free to the brunch, and then they give you 20 bucks. And it's kind of like a sign of... Yeah, how what the struggle is right now? Yeah, right. Just yeah. to get people through the doors, and it it kind of brought me back. It's like, man, before back then we used to be when you go to Tumon, there was a local discount. Right. And when I first moved back to Guam, I tried pulling. I was like, the local discount here. It's like, no. I was like, for real? We don't do local discount. Like, we yeah. don't appreciate uh -huh. a locals coming yeah. in here. I don't know. I got, I got. I think I got offended, and uh -huh. I feel bad for the waitress. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hey, I, I get offended because they charge me the tourist rate, you know, and then the the real tourists, the real tourists that just came from South Dakota, they get the cheap rate. Right, right. You know? You're getting 200 bucks at a Manila golf course, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah man. Yeah, so, and it got me thinking, I was like, man, they cut out, they cut out the local business, they cut out the local consumers and people mm -hmm. who want to go to these places yeah. Yeah. to tailor to, to the more, to the, to the tourists who are willing to spend that big dollar. Yeah. And when, when things sort of went to shit, it's yeah. like, like, oh man, we got to bring the locals yeah, back. Yeah. So in my head, it's like, okay, when all this is done and people start traveling here again, is this going to go away? And yeah. we're not going to see these, these local discounts to get locals through the doors okay. anymore. Right. Yep. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because this, in fact, the, the discount thing really is a good one. You know, I, I, we really should follow a, a policy where you actually check the ID like they do in most places. You shouldn't do it based on looks. Right. <laughs> Check the ID to yeah. make sure that person's a real, you know, resident. Yeah, we call it a Guam ID discount card. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, come on. So that's that's one. Do it, do it properly. Right. Uh, and then uh, the the point that you made about uh, being nice to people when you want their business only only when you want their business is really important because there have been cases where, I mean, let me just use an example. A hotel may turn away military turn away local saying, you know, we don't have rooms because, you know, the tourist is willing to pay $400 a night. Um, and they may turn them away in a way that that's not as, you know, as, um, you know, in a nice way. And then when business is bad, you know, you approach these folks and say, Oh, can you come to our place? It's, it's not really going to be, um, it's not going to be a good situation. So you really need to ma maintain the relationship. <clears throat> oh, for sure. And you just took the word right out of my mouth, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's those, it's those relationships. And I think that's what a lot of businesses that cater to, to, uh, to tourists sort of loss with locals, mm -hmm. right? Whether, whether you're tomorrow or not, mm -hmm. just if you consider, yeah. call yourself a local here, then, you know, we're a small place. We're not like New York city where mm -hmm. you can, where you can jack up the price and no matter what the yeah. the price will always remain the same mm -hmm. here we're we're actually feeling the effects right. directly of something that's not even here yet mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so so yeah that's really important so you mentioned the ho hotels what was the other one you mentioned um restaurants restaurants yeah same same thing um <clears throat> gosh there's something else on my mind i was going to bring up but yeah i, I think I think those uh, uh, the relationships um, really are key, and and you know that's that's part of your you know that's what as a as a management team of an organization for the for the larger properties and and for restaurants, uh, you really need to work on um, maintaining uh, those relationships. You know whether business is good or bad. Right. Definite definite lesson to be learned mm -hmm. you know with with all this even though it's we're not it's not a major major impact just the fact that people are feeling it mm -hmm. and it's happening during a time when you know they have to pay their employees a little more now right and they have to raise the prices on some of their their things that consumers want to you know buy whether it's at a restaurant or mm -hmm. or it's a local product that they're sourcing here right right and yeah 
Wow. That's tough. I feel like it's a, uh, it's, and if, if this thing plans on getting worse mm -hmm. and it does get here, um, you know, people, people are speaking about why don't you just close off all the borders, right? Stop people from, from flying in at all. <clears throat> Is that something that we want to do? You know, from a economic standpoint? Well, let me indirectly, uh, it doesn't have to be an official opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we will. <laughs> some somebody uh, sent to me a, a, an article the other day. Um, I went to school in in a small town in Colorado, Gunnison, Colorado. I don't okay. know if you've ever heard of Gunnison. No, I haven't. It, um, it's up in the mountains, and I I ended up going there because I ran on the track and cross country team. It's it's, it's the school is at 7,703 feet. Super high elevation. Yeah. So we used to say we're the highest institution in the nation, <laughs> but not academically. It was, right. known, it was known as a uh, party pot, school. Pothead yeah, school? It was, a, it was a party school. In fact, <laughs> it was Western State College. It was known as Wasted State. <laughs> <laughs> we had skiers, a lot of skiers, you know, right, party right. guys, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so Wasted State is where I went to school in Gunnison, <laughs> up in the mountains. And so the article uh, that was sent to me, uh, it was really about um, Gunnison in 1918 during the Spanish flu pandemic. And it was kind of like a model of how a, a community was able to keep out um, you know, the incidents of, uh, of the a Spanish flu okay. while everybody else was, was getting it. And one of the reasons was because it was so isolated and there was only one way to get into the town. This was not 1918. So you had to go on this narrow gauge railroad. So that was one of the reasons. But it also said something about, I thought this was the, to me, this, this was what stuck in my mind. It was a time when people trusted the media, public health officials, and government is what it said. <laughs> and so if, if somebody tried to, to bypass, you know, the procedures they put in, they put them in jail or they, 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 uh, they did, you know, they, they made sure that that person was not in the general, um, with the mixed with the general community. And so that's what they did. And I'm not saying that that's what we should do. I'm not saying that at all because we're not Gunnison, Colorado. Right. <clears throat> and, and times have changed. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if people trust the media and, no, you know, don't. you know, no. rest, you know, the other or the government or yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that's health officials. Yeah. <laughs> So it's interesting. In, in fact, uh, the article said that somebody, somebody wrote a book about a, a science fiction book about a town that survives some major, you know, outbreak. And, and they used Gunnison as a, as a, as a model because, you know, of what, what went on there. But, you know, I really don't know what the solution is. We were talking now about not letting people go to certain countries spring break is coming up and right. so the question is where do you go if you want to go to someplace in this region you're pretty much limited mm -hmm. and then what if while you're gone uh something comes out that says you cannot go back or you must be quarantined right so you're taking a big risk to go someplace now kind of going back to what i was saying earlier about um about being in a third, maybe you wanted to visit a third world country yeah. during that time. Right. And now, you, now there's no medical services for you. Your visa is about to run out. Right. Yeah. Right? right. They're not obligated to give you food or resources for food. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I know there's a DOE policy that if you're a student or an employee, you're not supposed to go someplace, but what if there's somebody in the household that goes someplace? Right. They're not a DOE employee. Right? I mean, how do you how do you control that? Right. You can't. It's almost like you can't. Yeah. Because we're interacting with different kinds of people every single day. It can just be someone we're walking by and they don't even know that they have it. Right. And then, you know, it's yeah. possible that maybe somebody has it and you have they just have the mild symptoms. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. Or, or they can come in because the incubation period is right. what they said, 14. It went from like 21 days to three days to 14 yeah. days. And I guess 14 is the official number they're sticking with. But mm -hmm. what if they came here during the, that incubation period? Right. Are we going to quarantine thousands of, of people for 14 days and be like, well, okay, can I you're clear. You? 
So <clears throat> where are you going to quarantine them and who's going to pay for it and who's going to take care of those people? Yeah, I, have, I, I wouldn't know where to quarantine yeah. them because there's absolutely no place, mm -hmm. right? And to be humane about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe the old Aganya precinct, but <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> I, I think I read something about UOG Fieldhouse, but yeah. you know, I mean, and that's something that I remember we had this discussion when I was in the hotel industry is uh -huh. if you find somebody with, you know, SARS or, or something and they're on the plane, what do you do when you find out and they're staying at your hotel? What do you do? All right. And uh, I think now they're taking out this 13 year old uh, policies and procedures and they're reviewing it now i believe that's what they've been doing the last couple of days of what to do in a in in, in this type of a situation taking out the old yeah. the old geography book yeah yeah <laughs> the mcmillan medical book <laughs> 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 it's tough it's and yeah. it's it's got to be a tough to be a leader today mm -hmm. yeah. you know, in, in 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 anywhere you are but mm -hmm. in in particular guam right and um, just to make those kind of decisions. And, and of course, of course, now we live in the social media age where every single opinion can be heard and can be written and can be posted and can be reposted and shared and everything. Yeah, and you don't know if, it, if the news that you're reading is real. Because I, I read that the Pope had coronavirus in, yeah, in I, the latest. <laughs> he, just, he just has a flu, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My friend, my friend messaged me the other night. He's like, "Dude, the Pope suddenly became ill." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, oh, and just the fact that this thing is popping up. And I was talking to my friend in New York, and mm -hmm. he's wondering. You know, he goes, "Man, people, people at my work are panicking," and I'm telling them not to panic. Mm -hmm. And you know how much it, it kind of leaves us in a sense of it's not just the media it's everybody's opinions involved and and you don't know what's true because everything's just being forwarded and um is it is it is it sensationalized in sensationalization you know is is this something that is there again all the conspiracy theorists will come out with all the theories of why why this is happening yeah. or, or if it's really if it's really a thing right mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who are skeptical about it it's like no man, just, it's a hoax. you're just sick. It's a yeah. hoax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and the first thing I read about it was, uh, and we're none of us are medical pro professionals, mm -hmm. so it's uh, the first thing. And the first thing I read about it was, it's it's you know the flu is more dangerous than this. You can more people have died yeah. from the flu than than the coronavirus. Yeah. You know, I, I I still think driving to work is more dangerous but the i think i think that the the difference is it may not affect you if you have it right but it may somebody else may get it who may not have the uh, ability to fight it off right right the immunity right is kind of right down so yeah <clears throat> so i think that's um i think that that may be the issue is that you may be bringing something in that could affect other people right yeah. So do you know of Guam before we should digress there mm -hmm. before we start becoming medical? Yeah. <laughs> start yeah, yeah, looking yeah, at yeah. WebMD. Yeah, <laughs> and start diagnosing. Right, yeah. It's like, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Schumann, I don't know, man. Yeah, I'm hot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm getting cold sweats. <laughs> <laughs> mm. it, it, it just, it's, I've, I just have a feeling it's going to start creating dis a discrimination towards, you know, towards people and most especially towards Chinese people. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the pop the maybe the general populace will be will be like wait why are we why are we letting chinese visitors into here they're the yeah. ones that's infected wait why are we letting korean visitors mm -hmm. into here they just they just bumped up like a, a thousand people who were infected by the coronavirus in a week mm -hmm. right and so it, it's uh it's it, it's tough because we're one we're not prepared for it and if and correct me if i'm wrong if mm -hmm. the fact that we are prepared for it and it's just not kind of out there but uh, what yeah. too i mean just going back to all the economic impacts that it can potentially you know uh put damage on right mm -hmm. yeah I, I think you're 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 right that we're not if we were prepared we would have 
test kits and right we would not we the would, defaulty the default the faulty it, ones that yeah, were <laughs> yeah so we would yeah we would have that and and uh we would know more about about this thing um but the, the discrimination thing i think is it's it's happening already you've probably read about the chinese restaurants nobody wants to go to chinese restaurant now in the states for example right um and uh yeah with with korea uh, we we always really we need to read everything or, or find out as much as we can. I believe their numbers and and just based on what I've read, it's because they're they're testing more, right? In in Korea, right? And, and they so, say that the reason why U.S. has uh, so little is because they're not testing. Yeah. So so there there's there's always you know we we always always need to to look into a little bit more and not not come up with these conclusions right uh and it's still kind of early it's only been what two months since this whole thing kind of started right yeah um but but i i think what what it does is it it opens up our eyes to how the world is how how we're all connected that globalization yeah yeah and and so let me talk about this okay. now um we we all need to see how we are interconnected and in many cases our young people especially in the u.s i was at a, a internationalization uh conference or workshop in indiana and uh, they they talked about this quite a bit how we need to internationalize our education many americans they drink that coffee that came from Colombia. they are wearing clothes that were made in bangladesh you know they are they buy stuff made in china but they really don't know where these countries are they don't know what the working conditions were are of the pr people making these products mm -hmm. uh and they really have um they're really connected to them just the the fact that that they purchase these products and right when i was there was when they had that building collapse in bangladesh where thousands of people died they were making these brand name clothes mm. And so, you know, that really um, points to the importance of getting people to understand how all of our, you know, the entire world is interconnected in some way and why we all need to start working together to come up with these solutions. It's not up to just one country. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Can Guam, is it possible for Guam to work with other Micronesian islands in in creating sort of a small ecosystem or market that the Pacific islands can build off of. Yeah, I, I think it's possible. I think there's always been, uh, there, there have been uh, efforts in the past uh, to meet with other island, island leaders and, and to do things. And here's another one. It, we've always been talking about marketing Micronesia as a region and not just as individual islands, but here's the challenge. Where's the money coming from? Right. And, you know, even GVB has a limited budget for promoting Guam. Right. And, and it's probably the biggest budget out of all right, the islands right. in Micronesia, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think it boils down to, you know, the funding. Uh, but I think there is an interest in doing more um, as a region. Right. And maybe we'll, we'll get to that point. Eventually. Yeah, Does, eventually. Do some laws need to change or anything like that? Well, you know, maybe we're, we're going to be forced to, to do this due to business reasons, environmental reasons, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> do, you, do you see, do you ever see Guam as sort of a hub? And I know I've asked you about this in 2016 about, um, you know, um, Guam become with, with marijuana mm -hmm. and you're like, no, <laughs> you know, now you came out, you came out with, oh, okay. with no, and it wasn't, you know, it, Guam's not going to be that area where people kind of flock to, to sort of experience something. Yeah. Right. And I think back then I used the, I used the, uh, marijuana as an example, okay. right. Th that industry. You know, I, 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 I don't like talking about this too much because it's almost like talking about religion. Okay. You know? But let me just mention this. I, I try to be uh, objective here. I, I listened to a, a professor, a tourism professor in Colorado talk about marijuana tourism in Colorado. And she she's in Durango, uh, Colorado. She said that 
you know, marijuana tourism did bring in some revenue initially. Uh, but she also said that they're not allowed to advertise. It has something to do with funding, you know, governmental funding okay. to advertise, you know, marijuana tourism. But they still had a, um, some revenue generation from marijuana. But she said most people don't go to Colorado just for marijuana. You know, it's like uh, curiosity. They go into the shop to try out the brownies and, you know, different kinds of things. Yeah. And she also said that there are also some people from New Mexico that cross the border to buy some pot, you know, for a few days. And then, and some people even leave tips in the hotel room instead of cash, they'll put the marijuana there cause they can't, they can't take it back. Right. They're not supposed to take it back. So your tips, you know, some, you know, marijuana, right. Right. But, but one thing that really stood out from what she said was that, uh, and remember Colorado is a pretty big state, has a lot of people, has a lot of well-educated, skilled mm -hmm. people. And they're having a hard time finding workers because many workplaces have a no to zero tolerance policy. So if they're having problems finding workers, what's going to happen here? Right. We are already having problems finding skilled, reliable, reliable, educated workers. Mm -hmm. And so what's going to happen if, you know, and, and many of our workplaces, they have contracts with the federal government, right. like hotels. Right. Right. Uh huh. And you got to have a zero tolerance policy. Right. So those are the things that kind of concern me when it, when we talk about this this type of thing. Right. So I'm not against people that want to smoke pot or you know I'm not I'm not uh, you know I, I'm just talking as what are the consequent possible consequences. The other thing trying to create an industry out of it here is yeah and troublesome. Yeah, you, you can say that oh yeah it'll create jobs and everything, but we really need to take a look at the positives versus the negatives and, and the positives really should weigh out the negatives right. and it shouldn't be just economic positives, right? There could be some negative social, economic, social, social, cultural, right? The other thing that uh, this professor mentioned was that Colorado benefited, but it was like as a, uh, one of the first, because you're the first, People go there, but you know, it's not going to be a differentiating factor. It was like when Jack in the Box came first. Yeah, right? you know, the first game here. So, you know, <clears throat> how long are you going to be the first? Uh, so, you know, those are the kinds of things that um, that we need to think about. And as you know, for many of our tourist markets, they don't differentiate between heroin, <laughs> cocaine. And it's all it's, it's all, all taboo. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's another that's another thing. So, you know. I think the people on that task force have a tough job. For sure. Yeah, it's 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 really tough. It's not it's not going to be easy. Cuz the the aim for Guam, we still want to be that family friendly place, right? Where people well, want to That's a that's a good question. Now, I I mm. actually I brought that up at a focus group meeting that we had recently when we we're talking about the tourism 20, 2025 plan. Do they allow public the public to these focus group meetings? Um, or is it, is it, it was kind a of a scholars? No, no, it was kind of a, I think they're, they're, they're doing different groups. Okay. So I was in the group with, um, you know, people that are in the education <clears throat> area. And I think they primarily wanted to talk about developing workers. Okay. But, you know, I kind of helped steer, I kind of steered, uh, into, uh, other areas because I think they're important in addition to developing the workforce. But what, what was it that, um, the topic that came up was, uh, what, what was the question you asked just before I, we got into this? Uh, we were talking about marijuana. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Family friendly. Family friendly, right. So are we really family friendly? We have strip show, strip joints right next to a uh, high end, uh, you know, I, I remember. Next to the amusement park. Adult book, adult shops, you know, in that area. I remember, I remember running by the West End and hearing Japanese kid reading the katakana on Storipu Show, Poru no. You know, so uh, are we really family friendly? Yeah. And I know that there was a time when we uh, talked about moving the adult entertainment <clears throat> district. You, you know, remember, remember the military bus stop, the Liberty <clears throat> bus would stop in uh, Anigua? Okay. 
right? Uh, Liberty. I don't, I don't know the oh. Liberty Bus, but okay. I know Anigua. You know Anigua. You know all those, and, all the all bars, bars and, there. Yeah. yeah. So they stop stopping there, is what I heard. They stop stopping there, and so now they stop in Tumon. So all these strip joints and massage parlors open up in Tumon now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so those guys moved into the Tumon area. So again, you know, are we really family friendly? And there was talk at one time to move the strip joints and all, all that stuff up behind Kmart, you know, the Harmon area. That way you, you, you know, can't the, see it. Yeah. You can't see it. And then the, the bus stops in Tumon, you can go up there. And if you're drunk, you can just roll down JFK Hill and <laughs> get on the bus and go back. So, you know, there was talk about that, but it never, never really happened. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess back to my question. I mean, it's, is that something that we're still aiming for? And if, if not, then what is the, what is the direction that Guam is trying to take? Thank you very much. In fact, that's what I brought up at the focus uh, group meeting is that we really need to look more long-term. Right. The long, and, and people have said in the past, oh, you can't look too long-term because things change. Well, you know, it, it's good to have a direction because if I'm running a business or if I'm starting a business, if I know that we're going in this particular uh, direction, then I can align my, my business with that, right? It's almost like having a mission statement. If you don't know exactly what your purpose is, it's, it, it's not going to be easy to make decisions. Right. PIC was approached by a ski ski property in northern japan we had just done a mission statement exercise and when they approached us it was a really good price for a ski lodge but it was easy to say thank you but no thank you we're really not in the business we're a pacific island we're we're a beach resort not part of our vision yeah it's not part of it so if you have that um that makes it easier to say no to certain things and to pursue other things is was there was there any particular answer when you posed the question? Mm, you know, I think the first step is to get this tourism twenty twenty five. I think that's the um, uh, the priority right now. But I think uh, I, I, I keep bringing it up because I think I think it is important. The question is, is it GVB's role, or should there be a tourism commission that's not affiliated with uh it's not totally you know affiliated with a government because as you know when the leadership changes they usually don't like doing what the previous leader did right right yeah and for for like a vision and a plan you really need to have something that's long term and maybe people that are not that don't you know and i'm not saying this just because i'm at the university but maybe from gcc you know maybe uh but it does make but, sense what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. Maybe from a certain re- certain industry, maybe retail, mm-hmm. and, and then you know uh, the community to get people in a commission that can make um, uh, put together a, a, um, a vision and a, um, a direction for the industry. So there. So what you're saying is what, or what I'm gathering is that there is no real vision as to what what we want in the future besides tourism that was my dissertation is actually on, uh, exactly on on this topic yeah uh the future of guam i would industry. love for you to expand yeah yeah well you know i i interviewed uh, a number of people in the government and private sector and asked them all the same questions it turns out that they didn't really share a common vision for the um the tourism industry mm-hmm. everybody had a different um you know n- not completely different but they weren't all on the same page um, so I think that's, that's what's needed. Critical. Yeah. And one of the things kind of like, it's almost like every man for himself in every industry. Right. And the, it's almost <clears throat> the, the industries aren't coalescing. Is that the right word? Wow. That's a, that's a new big word yeah, that I've yeah. used. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ooh, that was yeah, heavy. Yeah, with, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, without mentioning names, <clears throat> Um, you know, there are, there's one person who said, well, you know, business people, they're not going to, they're not going to want to talk about the hard uh, challenges. So when I talked about, for example, environmental sustainability, 
you know, what about, you know, the waste that we're producing? For sure. They're all taught, the, the answer would be about island beautification. The superficial stuff, like right. picking up trash and putting flowers and, you know, so the, the easy stuff is what people like to talk about. Right. They don't really want to. It's almost it to, like, it's almost like cleaning your room as a kid, but you're just putting it all under the right. bed. Yeah. You right. know, there are other really critical things to talk about, like, like, uh, you know, um, uh, the dump and about, uh, our, a water table and fertilizers and, you know, all kinds of things that have to do with uh, sustainability, oceans, um, right. Erosion, erosion right. from development mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, or even like tour companies, right. Um, like people that take tourists through off-roading and stuff, right. right? You're yeah. degrading the, you're degrading the landscape and it's causing, you don't know what effects that it's causing right. to the rivers below and where those water sources are headed to. And if people are drinking out of it, or if you're clogging up, what happened in pneumatic, right? Oh. They were, and uh, I had uh, Dr. Shelton on here mm -hmm. and I actually went to school with, with Dr. Shelton. And he was telling me about his pneumatic product, uh, pneumatic uh, yeah. project, right? Where, because people were burning the land mm -hmm. to, to expose the, the deer for hunting, they didn't know that it was causing a detrimental effect downstream near the mouth of the river. And it was and it was choking coral. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's another <clears throat> example of why uh, we all need to be involved. I'll give you an uh, example of the dolphin watching. Uh, uh, you know, many of the islands, people go to the islands a, a lot. One of the attractions is the iconic marine species, like Tonga. It's whales, right? Uh, Solomon Islands could be the sea turtles. Uh, New Zealand whales also. Um, and for Guam, we have a lot of people that go on dolphin tours. And I remember listening to a, a dolphin expert who lives in Tahiti, and he was saying that dolphins, they do their activities, uh, what they, they feed at night, I believe, they sleep during the day, and then they do their activities uh, before they go feeding, and then they, they play after they feed, and during the playtime, that's their reproductive time, right? Where they you know, do the reproductive activities. And so uh, if you see a, a dolphin with a baby dolphin, you see a pod with a baby dolphin, you're supposed to have a certain distance. Uh, and um, so there, there are certain certain rules. Okay. And so the, the question is, so, so are these rules, uh, do they do people follow the rules that go on the dolphin tours? You know, no, that's, not. That's, a, that's a question. I've I'm seen not, I've seen dolphins right by the yeah. hole of the... Of the bulls okay. sometimes, right? Yeah. So, so th these kinds of things. Again, I'm not a dolphin expert, mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, these are the kinds of things that we all need to be thinking about. It's not just the um, the land, and um, you know what's. Yeah. Sorry. He's that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's anxious. Yeah. So it's it's also the marine life, you know, and what what's going on in our oceans. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he'll settle down. Yeah, I mean, and and everything's affected, yeah. right, all around. And if we're not careful, uh, we could we can lose our resources. What limited resources we have here, uh, if we're if we're not having that mentality when it comes to creating industry here on Guam, right? Right. So this brought me to uh, another business idea. Okay. Is um, what is it, Agate right? Is where people get on the dolphin tour mm -hmm. boats. Right. So, you know, the one village, one product, um, right. mango, is okay. agate, right? Right, right. So you can, what about, why don't we make some um, dolphin-shaped mango cookies and educate people about dolphins? Right. You know, I mean, th those are the kinds of ideas I think we need to have is, is let's incorporate not just the, the uh, agricultural products, but what, what's that village known for? And you can come up with maybe a, a marine species, um, right? Right, right. Yeah. No, I see. I see what you're. I see what you're getting at, right? Yeah. Creating the you're creating product, but you're also making people understand yeah. why start doing certain things yeah. are in, are important to mm -hmm. what we're doing, right? And it's almost like why why aren't people doing things to recycle tires? You see people. Uh, if if it's not recycling and and putting putting it out, you know, uh, 
Matt re uh, putting it through the recycling process to make something else, but uh, you find people in different areas like actually taking these things, breaking it down themselves, mm -hmm. and creating new products out of it. Right. Um, and it's easy as it's easier said than done, but mm -hmm. of course, as with with all things, um, I truly believe recycling is the best place to start for us to educate people on how important it is, like to. Because right now, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, we have recycling bins, but they go to the same exact place as the regular trash. Mm -hmm. And how they're sorted, I don't know. Maybe there's maybe there's a process that I'm not seeing. Yeah. But you know, the automatic answer for anybody is no. Nah, it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. It's it's way too expensive for to 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 manufacture it or to process recycled goods. But people do it all over the place. Yeah. And not necessarily on super large warehouse scales but mm -hmm. people do it in the back in the back of their homes whether or or a small lot and uh, it's it's doable and I, I just don't i just don't get it i just don't get what the hold up is in in wanting to utilize that sort of thing to maybe you can have these recycled products and these plastics processed so that other people can use it to make new products right yeah well, you you know what you came you maybe think of another area and uh, Do Dr. Austin Shelton's been um, on this circular economy. Did he talk about that? No, no. Circular, have you are you familiar with? Okay, circular econ, econ one hundred and one. Okay, doc. <laughs> so so the linear economy is what we're all we all know. All right, is you take from the earth, you make something, then you dispose of it, right? Okay. And that's not sustainable because you have waste. All right. So circular economy is where you're already thinking about what you're going to do with that empty bottle. You know, when they design it, they already know how to use that waste. And so that's something that many places are doing. They're thinking circular. In fact, I read someplace, I think it was Netherlands. They're trying to be totally circular economy by a certain year. And that, that's a real um, radical change from the linear. And, and you think about this for a moment. Um, like, um, look at all the trash that we have here. I, I'd like to do, this is one of my uh, projects. That I would love to be a part of this project. Uh, we, have, we pick up trash and let's find out which, which company is most represented in that pile of trash. And why are we all paying to take care of this trash? Shouldn't, shouldn't there be an extended producer responsibility? Hmm. Shouldn't the people that produce that product take some responsibility in doing something with this trash? Right. You know what right. I'm saying? Especially yeah. single-use plastics. Right, right. I mean, you brought up, you brought up the, the, the rise of food trucks here on mm -hmm. Guam, but also with the rise of food trucks is the rise of all these single use plastics right. and styrofoams that are ending up in the, in the trash anyways. Um, uh, I'm not going to mention the business, but mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, they, they, uh, you know, they provide prepped meals mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I'm left with this humongous stack of plastic yeah. Yeah. containers. What am I supposed to do with this? Yeah. And so I was asking, I was asking the person, I said, is there a way we can, you know, maybe you can get a discount for flash, flash washing these mm -hmm. things and then they can reuse it. Like, how come there isn't a plan in or in their business yeah. to reuse these plastics? Mm -hmm. There's ways that people can re, uh, reuse things that have been used yeah. through running them through a cycle, right? Uh, maybe like a five process system to, to get it completely sanitized. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's something we're not doing. And, and it's, it's sad to see right now. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm glad all these businesses are coming up with food and stuff and to go is, is a thing to do. And because it provides convenience, mm -hmm. but the byproduct of it yeah. is not good for us. Right. Yeah. So green banana paper, uh, maybe Matt. Yeah, his name's Matty. Yeah, have you you've seen? That, I've right? met him before. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's come to Guam a few times, and I think he frequents Guam, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. So yeah, he does those wallets and business cards and things. But I think you can use. I think I I believe uh, Dr. Austin Shelton is working with him there to, to make plates 
and you know stuff that you can use yeah hey matt can you grab there's a stack of um i believe this is banana paper okay <clears throat> yeah there's a stack of like a uh, plates over there yeah. on yeah. top of the microwave want to grab it all right so this <clears throat> the circular economy concept um is is really interesting um and so tourism is not a a, a really um oh wow cool very nice thank you yeah so my oh, lady oh. the she i guess oh, yeah. one of the uh a part of their um uh you know how they did the startup weekend yeah, in Indonesia yeah. uh -huh. this is what one of them brought back uh, nice. was these reusable yeah um plates and i believe this is banana paper yeah i think i think it is so so yeah so if we look at uh, tourism you, from the very beginning you're not really being eco friendly because you're flying on a plane you're using all that you know that you're leaving that carbon footprint so already it's not you know really green right but the industry can really do a lot to try to minimize that by doing a lot of things like this and a bunch of others other things um like uh min minimizing food waste in fact i think it's in finland they have an app uh app, app, actually a few apps one of them is an app that people have and if you want to uh if they're the the kitchen has a lot of food instead of throwing it away they put on the app you can do take home really yeah and then so they they're able to make use of the food and yeah. also also have business <clears throat> there's also some apps in some uh, countries where tourists or even community members if you're a family you make a bunch of whatever and you got some leftover you can share it so it's community sharing of food right. and we know that many of our tourists they want to go and have a meal with uh right a local family right and so those are the kinds of ideas that are tossed around in the circular economy circular tourism uh and and it's another example how people shouldn't just think about tourism as a hotel and restaurant i'm like you're developing business but also coming up with solutions uh to address some of these challenges would you have. call it eco tourism or is that is that even such a thing yeah eco tourism yeah. is is a thing and eco tourism is not only helpful to the environment but it should also help the local people yeah and so that would be a good example of that yeah, Matt just brought up um it's is uh, well his Instagram name is Matty oh, Roots. Okay. And this is the green banana paper and how they I guess this is a video on how they process it and stuff. Yeah. Oh. So that's a good example of a uh, kind of a circular economy uh concept, right? Business. Right. right. So so they would in in the sense that it's circular because they're you're using the waste. Using the waste. You're using the waste to okay, okay. for business. And <clears throat> Matt, can you pull up another one? Sure. Poop paper. Poop paper. <laughs> Let's see if, if I have the right name, but I think it was poop paper. Yeah, poop paper. Poop poop paper. Online store. There you go. On the yeah, the link. Yeah, so that, that's this is an interesting business. You can pull it up on the video dude if you and what they do is they take, this is really funny. If you look at the website, it says, pull up a stool, <laughs> you know, and then they, they yeah. but what they do is they take um, mm. poo from the animals uh -huh. and because it has fiber in it from whatever they ate, and it doesn't stink. I wouldn't know. I didn't, I never really, <laughs> it, but so you can buy this uh, paper or these paper products. And it says uh, eco-friendly, tree-free, sustainable paper. So you, that's really waste, right? Right. And you're <clears throat> making uh, a, a product out of it. And I think they're doing a decent amount of business. And I mean, you wouldn't, when you look at it, you probably wouldn't even think poo paper unless you see right. poop paper. Right. So maybe we could do Carabao yeah. poop paper. Yeah. Have you seen Carabao crap? Yeah. <clears throat> it's massive. It's huge bigger than this <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and there's hordes of them yeah in naval magazine right? okay right, okay. Right, right, right so those are just <clears throat> a, f a few example examples but i said like i said it's really radical and in order for that to happen i think you would need government 
you know, policies, incentives for people to change the system from what it is now. Right. You can't depend on government to change the system. Right. But you can start with like businesses um, only working with suppliers that are also that have the same way of thinking where they're already thinking about what to do with the waste. Mm, now you got my mind turning. Yeah. Yeah. The wheels are definitely turning. I mean, I, I probably, I probably crap out a, a, a thousand ideas a, a, uh-huh. a day uh, to myself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't think in that eco realm, you know, at least, at least the benefits of it, because, you know, for us, we're taught, we're taught that, no recycling really happens here. You can't really upcycle things mm-hmm. uh, to make it uh, um, profitable or feasible to to create some sort of industry right. In it, uh-huh. right? or business on a smaller scale. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, there are people that appreciate non-McDonaldized products and they're willing to pay a little bit more for them. And <clears throat> so do you think, okay, in your, in your, in your opinion, what do you think the direction should become for for Guam? I think the first step, and I think we're <clears throat> I think we're going in the right direction is to get people to see that there are alternatives to working for somebody that you can also start your own business. And I also I also like telling people that you know the business should. A lot of the successful businesses are non-flashy businesses. Have you read The Millionaire Next Door or The Millionaire Mind? Mm-hmm. These are two really good books. Okay. And Noted. There's, there's, a, there's a business professor who wrote these. They're two really good books. One of them is The Millionaire Mind, and it's A Millionaire Next Door, and it's about common characteristics of millionaires. And, and you know, it's pretty common sense they don't they don't uh spend their money on flashy things um they think about the future um many people get into the trap of buying a fancy car and then they got to buy a fancy house to go with it and then they got to go to the fancy whatever mm-hmm. and so they don't have any savings but the millionaires um that he studied all had the characteristic of thinking ahead and s- saving and not not being too flash about um, keeping up with the Joneses, right? Right. And then The Millionaire Mind was a book about um, how these guys, what their minds are like, what they had in common. Mm-hmm. And what they had in common was one is that many of them were told you're a loser. <laughs> Seriously, you know, that kind of fired them up. Right. You know, you're a loser. You're not going to amount to anything. Right. Um, another common characteristic was um, they own their own business. Because, you know, like I said, your your income would be unlimited, right? Pretty right, much. Right. Instead of selling your time. And then, um, what was the other one? Oh, they all, they, most of them owned non-flashy businesses like junkyard or a funeral parlor or ca- a car wash. And, hey. <laughs> and, and the reason why, you know, they made so much, not everybody's interested in doing that, that stuff, you know? Right. And so... Um, that's what, that's what I think is, is, uh, um, the direction is look for businesses that, uh, that are non-flash that you're not, where you're not going to have that much competition. Not everybody's going to think about doing that because maybe they're not into that type of thing. Uh, and, and so what I was going to get at is, is we're developing more and more people that, uh, have this entrepreneurial mindset. I agree. I agree. And it's maybe, maybe one of the deterrents is the misconception on how hard it is to get a business license Mm -hmm. and maybe how hard the government has made it for people Mm -hmm. to get business licenses and be able to not only not only the government but also boils down to like real estate to where people sometimes people can't even afford to put themselves in a brick and mortar place because there's no i i came up with this i came up with this thought that if since there's a lot of empty buildings, you know, on Guam that could be used, uh, sort of convince the building owners or the property owners, uh, through a tax break or a tax incentive to give business owners 
a, a cheaper rent or a lease on the space mm -hmm. uh, that they can write off and and it allows more people to open up their dream store mm -hmm. or market right and stuff like that uh -huh. and i don't i don't know if it's even possible to do that or even people would even be open to doing that but the first deterrent is like oh man i can't do this it's too expensive yeah rents twenty one hundred dollars a month right yeah right and it's like well it's, how long has that place been empty it seems like decades yeah and so oh how do we convince these property owners now to to give to give uh to give uh it, to give business owners an opportunity and a chance mm -hmm. and is that the government's responsibility to sort of facilitate that or guide them through that uh, mm -hmm. i don't know yeah I, oh, I think one solution that's you know not totally the same as what you're recommending is is a uh, a maker space, you know, a place where a bunch of different businesses can go and use the space to make stuff. And it could be like a community kitchen. Mm. Um, so you can make your telefofo banana chips with doni pepper or inarahan sea salt, you know, um, flavor. Right. Cause not everyone has that certified right. kitchen yeah. space. Yeah. yeah. So that, that could be one way to, to get things started. I mean, those, the office spaces are sort of a new thing here on Guam. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Those community shared spaces. Yeah. Vietnam uh, is doing something really interesting. And I don't, don't know if this would work on Guam because, you know, we're, we don't have um, as many places to visit as uh, Vietnam does. But what they're doing is they're starting to attract digital nomads, you know, people that don't need to be in a certain place. They can mm -hmm. still work, right? Mm -hmm. So they have, they're having these, uh, there's, there, there are these new startup companies and one of them started this, uh, digital nomad, uh, business. I don't m remember the name. So they have a place where you can stay, a uh, nice room and they have a, tw they guarantee 24 seven internet, really good internet access. So you get to network with people from all around the world while you're working mm -hmm. at the, at the place. All right. And then every weekend there's a tour. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, playtime. They, they go and take them to, you know, a part of Vietnam and right. they have a great time and it's not that expensive. So you get to work, you continue making your money, whatever it is that you're doing. You get to live in Vietnam for a bit and then you get to see places that are guided and you also make, need, get to make connections with people from around the world. It really sounds like something that can be done here. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, you know, there. I think there are many ideas. Uh, I, I'll give you. Can I give you another? Oh, there is one place. There is one place that's similar to that. Before you go into that, is um, that the ITC? No, it's over at. Um, oh my gosh, I did some studying there. It's a purple warehouse uh, oh. over by the water, right after the mobile airport road. Mobile, mobile. Oh my goodness, it it escapes me, and I would love to kind of push their push their Maya, space Maya? because no um oh oh man i don't it's it escapes okay. me I, it, uh, hopefully it comes to oh. mind i would love to i would love to like kind of just give them a sort of a shout out because oh. the the space that they provide it's like the bottom is like this cafe uh and and there's tables and seats and places you can study and stuff and then upstairs you can actually lodge, right? That's the siesta, whatever. Siesta, yeah, right, there right, it right, is. Right. Yes, the siesta uh -huh. uh, on Marine Drive, right after airport, uh, the mobile airport. Okay. Uh, you have to go southbound to get to it, but mm -hmm. it's an awesome place yeah. to, to sort of study. And I, I notice a lot of high school students go there, and they spend a lot of time oh. there. And whether it's just to hang out with your friends or to actually do group work or okay. self-study, right? That's good to know. Yeah. Is there a coffee good? I don't know, but oh, I got to okay. say, I didn't really make this coffee too oh, okay. good. I even was oh. like bragging about it. I was like, oh, strong coffee. No, it's, it's I just good. put too much water. <laughs> 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 there I am grinding the beans like, ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's a good, uh, yeah, a good concept. Yeah, yeah. Pretty close and, to the airport. Yeah, and I yeah. think it's uh, Korean owners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. and it's and it's perfect. It's, like you said, it's right next to the airport. So you see a lot of tourists go there 
and they 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 just do like an overnight lodge because sometimes you have to check out of your hotel a little earlier so what am i going to do where am i going to put my bags yep. stuff like that right yeah yeah very good i was thinking about another business but you know i it, it escapes me i can't remember now <laughs> But yeah, there are, there are a number of uh, uh, pretty good concepts uh, out there. Yeah, and like like I mentioned earlier, Guam is it's a wide open field of. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I got it. Okay. You know, Guam has many very scenic spots, right? Mm-hmm. And here's here's an idea, and and you know, I, I do yoga. I have a messed up back. Okay. So I have to do you know I have to do it regularly. So I I've been doing it for a while. But, you know, um, there's a market for people that want to go on yoga retreats. And uh, there are many expat clubs. And I'll give you an example. I, I used to work at the Tokyo American Club. Okay. And the Tokyo American Club has... Is that here? It's No, it's in Tokyo. Oh, okay, okay. And they're, they're <clears throat> business people and their spouses... Um, and they, you know, they speak English, so that's that takes out the, um, you know, the the worry about language, right? Mm-hmm. So there are mar- markets in in Korea, in in Japan, I'm sure in China, expat, expat community that speak English that work for these multinational firms like American Express, United, you know, uh, Mitsubishi, and all these other big companies. Right. They would love to come to a place like Guam, and uh, let's say you have a yoga retreat. Seti Bay one day and next day in Arahan pools and you know that type of thing. So I, I think um, those concepts, also the wellness, health, wellness, uh, retreat type of uh, concept, also can work here. Right. There are many businesses in this region. Uh, they like holding uh, brainstorming retreats um, to figure out their marketing strategy. For example, for next year, when I was in the footwear industry. The Nike president uh, said that he took his team to the Great Wall of China, and and I guess they camped out there, and they were coming up with a strategy for the next year. So there, there are these um, business opportunities here. We just need to be able to deliver, you know, what whatever it is that they they need. Yeah, yeah, it's all about creativity at this point, mm-hmm. right? How creative can you be to, to, to create a need that people didn't know they needed or a want or or they no, didn't know that even existed right yeah and it's easy as putting it on the internet and making it available for someone not from here mm-hmm. to come and do it but it's owned by someone from here yeah and we can we can can we can maybe bring keep on bringing franchises and allowing people to come to guam and start businesses but what's what's stopping us locals from Mm -hmm. from wanting to achieve the same thing right is it because maybe we were ingrained in in our brains that opportunity doesn't lie here on guam and that you have to go to the states to seek opportunity um Mm -hmm. possibly but it has to stem from somewhere and but like 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 we mentioned earlier within the last five to ten years you've been seeing sort of a growth Right. And the amount of business, local businesses that people are partaking in, mm-hmm. right? Kind yeah. of believing in themselves and in the product that they're putting out there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's always puzzling for me. You know, and me, I, I work, I work as an engineer during the day, but mm-hmm. in the nighttime, I'm constantly thinking of, you know, ways, ways I can insert myself into the economy and, and sort of take advantage of the things that are made available because you constantly see other people taking advantage of the things that are available to us. And it's like, oh, well, it's like you said, not, maybe it's not about being first, but how well I can do it. Yeah. Uh, and you had uh, Dr. Mike Bivacqua here, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A few times. Yeah, a number of times. Yeah. yeah. Good number of times. Yeah. He wrote a really interesting paper on indigenous entrepreneurship i think that that's what he called it and and uh, it was about tourism and how when people drove down into tuman they would see las vegas style you know night show they would see americana but they really didn't see much uh that had to do with 
the local culture, mm -hmm. but that's slowly changing. Uh, there's still there's a lot more that can be done, a, a whole lot more, but we're starting to see entrepreneurs like um, Crowns, right? right, right. And, and many of the other businesses, Falkai and, mm -hmm. and others, doing business um, and, and getting a piece of the pie right. from, from tourism, these indigenous entrepreneurs. And I think we need to see more, more of that. And while, you know, people may think, oh, you know, uh, I don't think uh, our industry, tourism industry would want to see me. Actually, I think, yes, it's competition for them, but I, I think it helps us as a destination when you have more choices and not the same stuff that you see in other places. Right, right. <clears throat> and it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that you brought up the... Uh... You know, in the indigenous uh, uh, opportunity or uh -huh. cultural opera, uh, indigenous businesses to create growth, and we kind of get we kind of get fumbled in our minds of what is indigenous, mm -hmm. what is cultural. Does it necessarily have to be what uh, what was defined as culture and in, in indigenous back then? Uh -huh. Because I don't know. To me, we're creating new culture here. Yeah. Right. There's this evolution yeah. of a new culture that's been sort of, uh, uh, you know, bubbling up. And... Yep. Yeah, well, Dr. Underwood, mm -hmm. and this is a quote from him, you cannot freeze frame culture. Hmm. You can't, like, freeze frame to 1650 and say, oh, this is Chamorro culture. You can't say go to 1530 and say, because culture is always evolving. Right. And so I think that's important to remember. You don't you don't really have to identify a certain look or a certain period. But for a while, it's almost like because we lost that identity and culture, uh -huh. that we spent a long time trying to trying to get it back. And 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 meanwhile, we forgot that you know this is why why try to go back when we can evolve what we have now right, yeah. based on the things that this culture has been through. Yeah, yeah. So he. I, I, I listened to him speak at a Mariana's history conference. That's where he talked about this. You know, you can't freeze frame mm -hmm. culture, but he, he, you know, he's a funny guy. He was wearing a real big Sanahi and he says, you know, I, people are wearing this now, but nobody wore this before. And yeah. my grandfather probably laugh at me if he saw me wearing this now. <laughs> uh, and he said that um, people didn't do chants like we do now, you know, before big events. And so that's kind of uh, come up. You know, yeah, the, the Sina. Right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So all of these things, you know, they're, they've actually, uh, um, you know, come up in recent years. It, the, people didn't do this 20, 30 years ago. I think it's, it's a relatively recent thing. But I, I got to tell you a funny story. Um, in, in tourism, they need local products. And uh, for a long time, duty-free, you know what their local products were? No. Man in a barrel and woman in a barrel. <laughs> the one where the you pull the, up the barrel and the penis something. pops out, <laughs> yeah. and then the yeah, yeah, pop yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, that that was it. And they're not even Guam products, right. right? Yeah. And so you know that that was back then, and now I think they're they're more and because because I think uh, Guma, uh, Guam Unique Merchandise Association Art Artists I think is an organization. Okay. Uh, and DFS actually DFS. Um, got a grant for that and they've been working with um, some local artists to come up with some products so there have been some uh, there's there have been some uh, developments there with more local products but you got to be able to produce enough all the time you can't just make stuff when you feel like it right, right? Like, oh, today i'm tired <laughs> yeah i don't feel like making that necklace today <laughs> yeah so they go through all the training and you know they talk about these types of things yeah with these guys and and i think you know they've been fairly successful. Yeah, I've been. I, I also think about um, uh, uh, for Aganya. I walk Aganya. I walk my dog all the time mm -hmm. around Aganya. And there's a particular part of Aganya, and it's it's this like frontage road mm -hmm. off of Marine Drive, right? And um, over in Tucson, I used to live in Tucson, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, they turned this one street, and they would put up these five five by five uh, tents mm -hmm. that had the pointed tops yeah. and it was kind of provided for the vendors mm -hmm. and they would allow vendors to sell something every every sunday yeah. right and yeah. and this this street you know that street is like 
perfect for it. Mm -hmm. It's the perfect width. It's a perfect walking yeah. distance. Yeah. It's maybe like half a mile. And mm -hmm. if you want to go all the way down to, to the loop, it's a mile. And yeah, you can fill those spaces, places up with, with people who want to sell their things all the time and not just these pop-up seasonal pop-ups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those help, but yeah. they're not really doing uh, anything because because it's only a one-time thing, right, yeah. right? And if you can consistently get these people to get out and constantly work on their craft and work on their products, if they're making it or they're bringing it in and they want to sell it, yeah. right? It's still an opportunity for people to be able to sell these things yep. in, in a quarter mile space and and be able to, to support the businesses who are on those streets, yeah. right? And yep. food trucks or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah, so good examples of this, you know, Bali is known for arts and crafts. So Balinese products, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that that's kind of evolved over the years. Um, the other one is, uh, uh, I was gonna mention the um, the Ainu. Do you know the Ainu? No. Uh, Matt, can you just type in A-I-N-U and then tattoos? And while, I, while he's bringing that up, uh, look at what's happened in Australia, the, the um, Aboriginal um, uh, tourism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're also able to um, create products and experiences for people because, you know, that's the culture, right? Right. So this Ainu, um, take a look at some of these ladies. Can you just click on images? <clears throat> sure. So this is, a, this is an indigenous uh, po population of... Uh, people in um, northern Japan up in Hokkaido and uh, they're really uh, they're they look different from the Japanese these there was only at one point I believe it was only down to like 25,000 people really but now there's a resurgence of the Ainu culture uh, and, and tourism is actually helping uh, to bring back uh, bring back the culture in fact, I think they should get royalties from Batman, the Batman franchise, because they're using the <laughs> Joker. The Joker's using their um, their tattoo. Right, right, right. But you know, again, they, those are some examples of Balinese culture, um, uh, Ainu culture, the Australian uh, Aboriginal culture. Um, if it's done properly, uh, tourism can help revive the culture, and the more audience you have the more people appreciating your culture the more you're going to practice it right right so mm -hmm. so there is a way to um to have tourism help help with this uh cultural revival so for the ainu what did what did they is it for their where, what part of japan first it's, it's a northern, northern part okay. yeah and and they have a bear they have all these it's very fun. It's very interesting. They have a bear. You see that one picture of the bear up on the top? Okay. So, yeah. So, in northern um, Japan, many people don't think about this. They think, oh, Japan's all major metropolitan area city. Yeah. But they, they have uh, bears, and they do uh, certain rituals with the bear. Uh, and they, like, like I said, they look kind of Caucasian, right? They look a little bit different. Right, they do. Yeah. And so that's the indigenous population of northern Japan. They've been there for a long time. Interesting. What is the story behind the tattoos on the mouth? Uh, you know, I, I really don't know exactly what the origins of the tattoo, but the tattoos are mainly, it's the ladies. Okay. Uh, and they're just cultural practices from, from a long time ago. And is this something that people became interested in that helped with the tourism in that area? Yes, yeah. Okay. And for a while, they were kind of like, Put a set aside you know because japan was known as like a one race country right and and uh so so um these guys were almost you know almost down to zero like only a, like a 25 i believe it was like twenty five thousand at one point yeah um, but they're making a comeback uh they're having i knew music um they're producing i knew music art uh, and they have an Ainu village that you can visit when you go to the northern part of the uh, country right. in Japan. You know, and it, it's it's interesting you bring that up because um, I I also I'm of I am also of the belief that uh, art the arts 
is what may be the driver mm -hmm. for economy here. Yeah. I mean, it's when people become interested uh, in, in, in things that come out of a certain place, they're like, oh, shoot, I want to go there. Right. I want to see what they're doing to make this. Mm -hmm. And it may not be indigenous art or things that were that were carved or or drawn or tattooed for thousands of years but it could be stuff that we're producing today right yeah that maybe a hundred years from now it's gonna be like oh mm -hmm. they were making that stuff a mm -hmm. hundred years ago yeah in 2020 mm -hmm. right yeah it, it could be music it can be, you know, yeah, what, whatever. And and that's why I'm extremely impressed with the kind of music that's been coming out, mm -hmm. you know, on Guam. Yeah. And the way it's been able to, to the expanse it's reached mm -hmm. with people. You see a lot of the artists on, on social media and they, they put what, uh, Spotify, when Spotify gives them their end of the year results, mm -hmm. they, they can get a sense of where their music is being yeah. listened to. Yeah. And like Guam. Where's that at? Uh -huh. da, 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 da. Yeah. Oh, yeah, shoot. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to just go to there. Da, 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 da. Right? Yeah. But, you know, just one word of caution is, you know, you really need to be authentic. authentic. In other words, don't try to do whatever it is with your art to think you're going to meet. Let me let me put it this way. I don't like going to shows that were made just for tourists. I, I'll walk out right, right away because I can tell right. that this is like a tourist trap performance right and so i think that's really important people want to see authenticity so if it's music if it's today's music just be real you know i mean don't don't try to adjust <clears throat> make adjustments to match what you think the tourist wants to see or hear yeah i don't i don't know if twitter's your thing at all or if you uh, no, I, okay I, yeah well there is this there is this um every now and then there's something that pops up mm -hmm. on twitter where people start discussing possibly yeah. argue mm -hmm. and that's just the that's just the nature of the twitter beast yeah and uh one thing came up was cultural dancing mm -hmm. right so a lot of people on facebook with, because fest pack was going to be held in hawaii yeah. mm -hmm. there was a lot of controversy of guam performing polynesian style yeah, yeah, dances yeah. which is not representative of the place right mm -hmm. of of our region and um and yeah, it's and the I guess Hawaiians believe that that Guam doesn't pay homage to the fact that you know they use their cultural dances and people don't realize. And I, I believe it was Polly Eric Forbes that that shared this with me. Um, I think it was back in the seventies. I want to say the guy's first name is Patrick. Mm -hmm. well, I don't exactly know what his last name is. Um, his first name might be wrong, but he said it was brought it was brought to Guam. Because in Hawaii, that's what the tourists, that's what American tourists were presented with, mm -hmm. right? Was was sort of the lays and the mm -hmm. dance as you're walking through the lobby yeah. and then the dinner shows. And that was that was the mock-up of how they were going to uh, present culture right. here uh -huh. on Guam. And it's kind of a thing that just sort of stuck mm -hmm. from years to years and and guam cultural dancing and i'm not part of the cultural groups or anything like that or societies or dance groups and stuff like that so i don't really really know and i don't have a i probably have a wrong opinion on it mm -hmm. um but yeah that's the way i was i was come to understand why we have the dances that we have now and there's people who try to you know they you you want to say make up mm -hmm. but they uh hmm gosh kind of kind of i feel like i'm treading in the, in the uh -huh. no, deep I, twitter waters yeah. right now so what just because it's a yeah. sensitive it's it becomes sensitive yeah. to yeah. a lot of people who kind of hold true to that like i'm a cultural dancer well you're telling me everything i've been doing is is fake no we know we're doing tahitian dances yeah. right we know we're yeah. doing polynesian dances and and so what if the things that the tomorrow chants and the dances that we do that we consider tomorrow or may not be from 4,000 years ago or 1,000 yeah. years ago. Well, nothing is totally original. We know that, right? Right. I mean, you know, it, it, you've always had influence from somewhere, but uh, you should try to be true to what it is that, you know, you, the culture does instead of trying to adjust, mm -hmm. I think is the, is the main point. Trying to, you know, 
figure out what it is. Oh, the tourist wants to see this and that. I think, I think, um, that's really not the way to go. I agree. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think instead of trying to chase what, and you know, honestly, I might get a, some backlash mm-hmm. with people who, you know, really hold true to the, to the indigenous culture and really try to perpetuate it. And I have nothing against anything that they're doing mm-hmm. to holding on to the culture, but I'm, I'm a real big believer in this new culture that we've, that we we're starting to evolve and that people are going to look back and like, Whoa, these guys did something, something mm-hmm. happened in, in the decade of 2010 to these people who yeah. were living here. Mm-hmm. And I want to, I want to do some research on it. And I want to know what happened. I want to write about this. Yeah. And, and we don't know what the next 10 or 20 years is going to be for us. Right. But yeah. it's the outlook is great because mm-hmm. We we're we're using our identity that we've created as not only Chamorros but mm-hmm. Japanese, Chinese, mm-hmm. Koreans, yeah. Americans, yeah, you know, or Caucasians and and uh, uh, blacks and Mexicans mm-hmm. and whoever whoever's decided yeah. to want to be here on Guam and make their life yeah. here on Guam, they're yeah. part of that cultural shift. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I, and you bring up a good point. I think I think it's it's important to show, you know, what the indigenous culture is doing, you know, uh, but also what makes Hawaii attractive is the multicultural aspect of Hawaii. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, that could also be, uh, helpful to show, you know, showcase some of the, um, the different cultures, uh, in a, if 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 one feels that oh you know maybe we don't have enough to to um, fill a certain amount of time there's there's also there, there are ways to uh, introduce uh, other aspects of uh, the community and so that's also a, an option I think uh, in Hawaii they have that uh, what's that uh, BYU does the Pol- Polynesian um, you know about that no Polynesian Cultural Center okay. And so they have students there dancing. I've heard of the Polynesian Cultural Center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I believe it's BYU, Brigham Young University of Hawaii. They have students uh, performing there, and that helps them earn, uh, you know, money for school and okay. that type of thing. And I'm sure that they have uh, people from Hawaii, but also other islands, performing uh, in that in that place. So, you know, it's possible that we, we could probably do something. We have enough people from other islands here. Like Palau, yeah, right, yeah, uh, Pompeii, <laughs> yep, yep, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you know, I, I see, I see these students performing uh, regularly at Charter Day, okay, and so that may be another opportunity to show the other islands as well, for sure, yeah, yeah. putting them in now the dinner shows that you have yeah. over uh, over in Gun Beach area, right, or Fish Eye, yeah, wherever it may be, yeah, and you're totally right. We don't have to go through the we don't have to keep that Polynesian uh, shift now. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. You make a great point. Yeah. And why haven't we kind of dove into that? Hmm. Yep. And so, yeah, that's, that's a, another opportunity for us uh, with the dance. But you know, when the comment you made about the cultural dance, I've heard that uh, a number of times whenever we do, we've done focus groups with um, residents and one of the areas I need to get on one of these yeah. focus groups. Well, I didn't know I'll, they had. I'll, I'll mention your name. <laughs> I'll mention your name next time. We're, we're I'm like curious yeah. on what these, what you know, what people are talking yeah. about. Yeah. So you know, GVB has invested a lot of time and money in cultural dance, right? Yeah. And so we've had people say, well, you know, it's okay to to do that, but there are people that have voiced um, their opinion about the fact that it it's not real. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and I'm not an expert on it, so I can't tell you know what you know what 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 is real and what isn't. But uh, that that has come up a number of times. Um, but there is a there, I think GVB is pretty serious about depicting the uh, the Chamorro culture um, properly. I think they're you know they take these uh, they take the um, comments very seriously. Mm-hmm. So it is important to have these uh, focus groups that listen to what people are saying. And in fact, let me mention this. If we're going to have a really um, successful tourism industry, you need to have the support of the local people. Yes. And 
you know, we've been lucky that we haven't had a line of people on airport road saying tourists go home. We have not had that, but other places they have. Really? Yes. Barcelona, uh, especially in Europe. They're, because the industry stopped paying yeah, attention. Venice, they, they, don't, they don't like what's happening to their place. So they're saying tourists go home. And so whenever I do like a SWOT analysis of threats for Guam as a destination, nobody's ever really said anything about local protests against tourism. But that is a real possibility. So it's very important to make sure that we know how the tourists, how the residents feel about tourism in their community. And not only when there's a yeah. potential pandemic, right. right? Yeah. So again, GVB... You know, we got to give them credit that they do this survey. You know, it can be done more frequently, but at least every five years it's done. And let me just mention one more thing that kind of bugs me is when, you know, I'm pretty connected with people in the sports community, as I'm sure you are. Mm. I read in the newspaper, Guam is having a triathlon at Leo Palace. We already have uh, 300 people signed up from Korea. So what's happening is people in Korea are notified even before the local residents. That's like telling somebody, hey, hey man, I'm having a party at your house. I already invited 50 people. <laughs> right. You know, as a courtesy, you always let the local people know because you're hosting. Right. You're gonna rely on them for volunteers, right? Mm -hmm. And usually those volunteers are the same people. They get kind of volunteered out, <clears throat> right. right? Right. So as a common courtesy, let the local residents know uh, that they're hosting this event before you go out and talk to people, you know, in other countries. Those tourists don't want to come and, and participate in an event that's all Korean or all Japanese. They want to interact with local residents. So as long as I'm involved, I'm one of the sports, Guam sports events, um, the board members. Okay. When we do the United Guam Marathon. Right. I, I always want to see at least half, half, local half, at least, and uh, half uh, off island because that's oh so they do get off island volunteers. No, no, no. I'm talking about people running. Oh, running, running, yeah. right? Okay, okay. I don't want it to be an all tourist event. I want it to be a, an event where, you know, that's the whole idea of it is to get them to interact with. Got it. Yeah. Visit. I mean, uh, locals. Right. Right. That makes it m more special. Mm -hmm. But as far as letting people know about an event, let the hosts know first. Right. It, it seems to be common sense, but you know that's not always the case. So you can have a one-shot, one-time event. It's not going to last if you want to do it that other way. But if you want it to continue to be a successful event. You've got to uh, have some respect for the people that call that place home. Right. Yeah. Right. And that definitely, yeah, that definitely helps. Are you still running? Do you run the marathon? I, you know, I don't, I don't do it as much because I'm an older, older guy now. <laughs> uh, but I try to, you know, stay, stay fit. I, I, I run a few times a week. Okay. Yeah. yeah just for hobby now. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. You know, and and I agree with you. The more we, the more. The more these tourism companies include, and, and that's why it seems like we've been cut out of the equation, right? And now they're trying to bring us into the equation, back into the equation. It's like, eh, how long is this gonna last? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we don't want. I don't. I don't want to be. I don't want to continue to have that doubt in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to. I want to know that what we're putting into it, we're also we're also a beneficiary out of it, not just the people who are coming here, right? And I think for the most part, like, like I said, we've been fortunate that um, we have not had uh, people protesting uh, out public. And I, I think I should give credit to GVB for the STAR, I mean, the Survey of Tourism Attitude of Residents, the STAR survey. I also should give credit to uh, the Tourism Education Council. You know Heidi Ballendorf? No. Okay, anyway, she kind of heads that. Okay. And tourism, uh, Matt, write that yeah. name down, Matt. Yeah, she yeah, she'd be a, her on the podcast. Yeah, good person to talk to. She's a spokesperson for GWA, also. Okay. Anyway, Heidi uh, uh, sees that, and in the past, 
uh, it used to be called the VIEC, Visitor Industry Education Council. And all they talked about was, you know, wave, uh, you know, all the, all the feel good stuff. Half a day spirit. Half a day spirit. And all that's important. It, it is very important. But really to, to be taken seriously, you have to talk about the possible uh, things that can happen if you don't do things properly. Educating people about, you know, here are some mistakes that other destinations have made. And, you know, let's, let's try not, let's make sure that these things don't happen. Uh, so the Tourism Education Council has been uh, instrumental in, in educating young people about um, the positive, but also um, uh, the steps to take to minimize the negative or to avoid the negative. Right. Right. But it's something you can't completely control, right? It's because, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I feel like it's, I feel like it's kind of tough to <clears throat> educate people, but if you're only educating a certain group, then the the general population kind of doesn't go under that same understanding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there there are a number of things like out, out, outreach programs and yeah. stuff like that. Well, I remember I said about the uh, people say, "Oh, you know, you you can't make much money in the tourism sector." It doesn't help when you have media. And I, I have a gra I have a graphic of this when they, they put the uh, wages of hotel workers, wages of the pri private sector, and then they show Gov Guam and everybody looks at that and they, and they say, wow, Gov Guam's overpaid. But they don't understand that in the private sector, they don't share exempt salaries. They don't share manager salaries. They're not going to tell you how much a general manager makes or how much a department head makes because right. it's exempt. Right. Uh, it's exempt from the wage and hour laws. So they're taking the average of um, hourly workers, and then for Gov Guam, it's everybody because it's public information, including directors and you know management. Mm -hmm. So you're all the way up to the governor. Yeah. So you're you're comparing government, all government, including management, with hourly workers in the private sector, and of course everybody's gonna say, "Wow, man, you know those guys are overpaid and people are underpaid." So it's not a uh, not a real comparison. It's not a valid comparison. Right. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, edu I guess education is part of it, is getting people to not believe everything, you know, look into it a little bit more, uh, ask questions. Uh, all, that's, all that's really important. Be proactive. Yeah, be proactive. All, all you know, all that good stuff. <laughs> Matt, how long have we been going here? We've been going for two hours and 45 minutes. What? Oh, really? Yep. Oh, wow. Wow. No way. That was way. <laughs> Shoot. Holy cow. All right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Huh. Yeah. I didn't expect that. Yeah. Yeah, that was a I I I thought we were still like under under an hour yeah. or an hour uh 2 hours. Yeah. I didn't know we were touching the 3 hour limit. Yeah, sorry, Matt. You know, I, I think for us it went by quickly, but you were probably uh wondering <laughs> when you could stop. <laughs> Now we'll start. We'll stop. We'll start uh, closing it out. And okay. I would definitely love to have you back on the show more. You know, I won't wait three years for us to continue right. our conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we had a lot to talk about. Yeah, here. yeah. And uh, it was. I, I felt like it was very productive, progressive thinking. And I, I would love to keep on picking your brain as things sort of evolve on your side of the world. I'm, I'm not exposed to, you know, economic trends and mm -hmm. and things that are going on in Guam on the daily. It's sort of things that I have to search for and um, if yeah I, I yeah. would love to just continue to yeah. just do this and I, let me just say you know it's good to see that you're very uh, broad-minded you know you're not you're not just focused on in one area and having that bro you. broad mind is really important it's uh, it's to no credit of myself it's honestly everybody who's been on this show uh -huh. has been able to educate me in different ways of based on their experiences or their education or just or just their life lessons mm -hmm. and it's things that i've kind of taken hold and and grasp onto especially with like doing this podcast is what's made me continue to love doing this and inviting people over to sit down for two one two three hour conversations right. and uh just share ideas and 
Uh, so no credit to myself. I'm not a big reader either. Uh-huh. It's just this podcast has sort of opened my mind up mm-hmm. to uh, to be able to do so. So thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Is there anything you want to put out there? Uh, people, how people can, you got anything coming up that people won't, should attend, uh, that people might have interest in? Yeah. Here, here's sure. one, just a preview. I know it's, it's down the road, but uh, I have 12,000 slides from GVB, and I'm going to be converting a, a number of them to, to, to digitize them. Okay. I hope to have, before the end of the year, uh, a public function where I show the development of Guam's tourism industry from the 70s all the way to 2000. And I want it to be a fun and educational event, and you may see your friends, relatives, you know, uh, in some of these photos. So I, I'd like to just let everybody know that that should be coming uh, later on this year. Well, if you need people to be a part of it, I would, I would love to, and Matt would definitely love to, you know, yeah. be a part of something that cool. All right. Uh, yeah. Sounds good. Dr. Schumann. Yep. Thank you so much for, for coming back on the show. All right. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. And, um, yeah, gosh, go to UOG and see doc, Dr. Schumann. Yep. Uh, my lady asked me to say this, uh, she was, you're one of her favorite professors during the uh, master's program. Oh, that's nice And, to hear. uh, and she, she loved your stories and she'll come out when we're done. But, uh, yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was great having her. She really, uh, uh, stood out, uh, in the group and, uh, she was a lot of fun to work with. Yeah. So, yeah. and I'm sure she'll love to hear that. All right. Now it's on the podcast. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for listening to another episode of the podcast with Dr. Schumann. So, yeah, go to UOG, pick Dr. Schumann's brain. He's incredibly smart, got a ton of stories and a ton of experience. And um, I'm, I'm glad to be able to get him back on the show. And this is definitely not going to be the last one. I'm definitely not going to wait three years to get him back on the show, four years. And um, until next time. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the podcast with Dr. Fred Schumann. And it was good to have him back on the show after so long. And I'm not going to have it be so long till I have him on the show next. So in regards to the coronavirus, just keep your hands clean. Keep uh, Maintain good hygiene. Uh, sneeze and cough in the right way into your arms or wherever it may be. And until we get until this all blows over and it eventually will uh, we've gotten through this as a society before and I believe that we can do it again uh, don't believe into the mass hysteria and panic just continue living life but with extra precaution uh, don't forget to support us on Patreon uh, don't forget to rate and review the podcast and other than that be nice to each other be kind to each other and talk to you later later